There we go. We're going. We are live. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Today's date is September 29th, 2019, and I'm here with Bob Grenier of the Martin Fleischman Memorial Project. Um, I'm pretty excited about this. It's one of my first, I would say, big guests, but uh, let's get right into it, shall we? So if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to, to chat. It's going to show up live on the screen, so we can record it for later. And um, yeah, let's get into it. So, welcome. Appreciate you being here. Are we good? You can hear me? Okay. All right, all right. Um, so, I guess, uh, tell, tell everybody a little bit about yourself first, just for people who don't know who you are. Uh, my father was a farmer. Uh, I grew up in Worthing, uh, which just happens to be the town that Martin Fleischmann's family uh, fled to uh, prior to the Second World War uh, to go and live. Uh, and uh, I uh, uh, have a fairly large family. And uh, yeah, so, uh, so it's a small, well, it's, it's the largest town in West Sussex, but it's not a big town by international standards. Um, and I had uh, the fortune of a father that would let us, uh, you know, use explosives and, and <laughs> uh, um, drive around in old bangers on our farm and, or, or, you know, weld things together or make rockets or all kinds of different things that we were just boys being boys. Um, but it was it was science. It was exploration and, and so forth. So uh, I had that fortune in my uh, early childhood um, to have uh, access to, you know, machine shops and so forth. And I got a fascination with science. Uh, one of the first things I did was I converted my uh, bedroom to run off solar. So I, I created this whole sort of parabolic uh, mirror array that went onto a solar panel and the solar panels were really expensive then so I had to come up with some sort of solar concentration system and then I stored that in some batteries there weren't any fancy lithium ones back then but then uh, I used that for my lighting in the evening and uh, for my fan during the day in the summer and I built a, a solar system for heating uh, uh, the swimming pool that we had uh, later in my uh, childhood at a sort of motel that we we switched from farming to motel uh, long story <laughs> uh, <laughs> a, a real, real estate investment type of deal i mean you know there's uh, no 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 what it was is there were, there were subsidies that came in to to dutch farmers uh, 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 in the 1970s and uh, within two years those subsidies destroyed uh, ah. uh, my father's two prime businesses he used to grow like uh, something like 16 tons of tomatoes a week and 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 uh, 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 he grew mushrooms before that and he, we also grew potatoes and flowers but the two core core products that the the, the, the uh, tomatoes and and the croissants they it was cheaper for them to deliver with the subsidies uh, in refrigerated lorries anywhere in the UK than my father's cost of production so right. this this is where a, another nation providing subsidies to their producers can destroy in an incredibly small amount of time a multi-generational business uh, um, and then once you're destroyed they can remove the subsidies and they've got the market so yeah Dis disruptive know, um, yeah disruptive yeah and, uh, arbitrage in a way yeah yeah but of course I, I learned about the greenhouse effect my father actually used uh, the, the real greenhouse effect let's put it that way <laughs> uh, my father used to use uh, uh, these paraffin burners uh, uh, to increase the temperature of the greenhouses to to uh, lengthen their uh, uh, growing season, but also uh, it produced carbon dioxide. So you've got a double whammy. And yeah. carbon dioxide is a food; it's good for plants. They yeah. like it. It's not a poison. Um, and so uh, you know, although we did use <laughs> I re one, one image I have as a as a, uh, a child is every year. Um, to remove all the parasites and, and stuff that were growing, uh, that may have accumulated in the soil uh, at the end of the season. What you would actually do is you would take a pile of sulfur and you would put it in the middle of the greenhouse. These greenhouses were massive and you would actually light the sulfur. It would make sulfur dioxide and you were effect effectively fumigating the entire greenhouse. And then <laughs> I imagine I wasn't there, but you would probably vent this to the, to the environment. That would kill yeah. all the parasites in the environment. 
So, yeah, I, I learned uh, about closed systems, uh, about chemical use in, in closed systems in order to I improve uh, the growing potential uh, and uh, the, the pest resistance of, of different things. And the other thing is I, I learned about the importance of pollination. So, for instance, we used to actually manually go around with uh, Q-tips like <laughs> on the earbuds and, and pollinate the tomato plants. You know, I started work at the age of four. Uh, some people might find that's odd, but you know, it's it, child it's labor. Fun. There's there's some child labor laws. I'm sure that. Uh, I, I, I <laughs> when I, when I say started work, I, for me it was fun. I was yeah. learning. You know, my father wasn't whipping me. I wasn't on a ball and yeah, chain. That's and, good. And in a small wood box. No. <laughs> I, that's the point of having kids, right? I mean, that's why I had kids. To be honest, is you know, a little extra labor, to help around the house. <laughs> <laughs> You've got them running the generator right now. To yeah. Run your laptop, right? yeah, exactly. Exactly. Actually, I so have one know, of them that, holding that, that a microphone boom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was me growing up on a farm. And uh, um, uh, my, my parents, for various reasons, found the local education wasn't um, up to scratch. And there was a scheme that was available. I got to a very good school through that scheme. And then I got to a good university, an engineering university, and uh, um, did a... Uh, a course called Special Engineering Program, which some people called someone else's problem, but uh, <laughs> or, or systematic eradication of personality. It was like every course they did at Brunel University, and you had to do every course. So it was like material science, electrical, electronics, uh, you know, psychology, accounting. You did everything everyone else was doing. So you have a broad, uh, broad spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, um, that I, I continued on to the in the second year on the sister course, which was a manufacturing engineering specific course, and um, that was more practical based. And and essentially, um, uh, I I had the opportunity to work in the pharmaceutical industry, and then the advertising and promotional businesses <laughs> uh, at the top level, uh, okay. you know, promoting some brands and. Uh, uh, that I, I eventually walked away from. Uh, that there was a, a, a moment where this uh, organization that I was supporting were uh, promoting tobacco products by ah. handing out tobacco products to children on the beaches of Africa. And that, for me, was the moment yeah, where that I sucks. Like, oh, the magazine, uh, magazines or like what particular... Um Form, uh, format did they use? For people could find out if they wanted to, but it, it, it was it was right at right at the top level of international uh, marketing. Yeah, that's and then, yeah. then I happened to work right in the centre of the city, in the belly of the beast. And ultimately, uh, it was a situation where I found myself left, left justifying uh, text boxes in PowerPoint presentations because someone else was brought in to help me, but they didn't really know how to use the software, and uh, uh, they were adding to my the time it was taking me to do the work. And uh, 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 when I was invited to the Royal Society to talk, talk about the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project, um, uh, and I, uh, I thought this is it. I, I don't even agree with the way banks make money. You know, uh, I know they provide a, a mechanism by which uh, money flows in the system, and is the way, the mechanism we 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 have to work with or seem to have to work with. But uh, um, I, I I I made them look good. Nine and a half years, and at that point, I thought I really want to. I'm not learning anything here. Yeah, uh, I really, I really want to be stagnating, to, and and yeah, and you got to do what makes you happy too, right? I mean, did, did it make you happy? You got to do what makes uh, you happy. No. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. <laughs> I think that's the most important thing is you do what makes makes you happy. So, like you just talked about the banks too. This and this totally. I wasn't even going to ask this question, but it t ties in. What is your opinion on cryptocurrency? How do you think that that will affect, you know, maybe the uh, engineering and applied science community or just in general? Well, what do you think about always, cryptocurrency? There's always, the, there's always the question about where the crypto uh, currencies, uh, you know, came from. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, from the point of view uh, of monetary system, you know, they, they are divisible. They, they can hold their value, although they go up and down. Uh, it's gonna crash. Um, right. Well, that's like any market, though. I mean, that's pretty much any market. Yeah, but I mean, if, if there genuinely is a limit to the amount you can mine, where, right. for instance, Bitcoin supposedly is that, um, then and it is divisible to any amount, then you know it it has that kind of gold-like money property uh, that gold has that that fiat actually technically doesn't. It doesn't. So, yeah. you know, fiat's always. 
failed at some point. Uh, I mean, the dollar's done very well, um, uh, but w what has had to be done to maintain that l longevity of a, a currency? Well, right. Um, I mean, I think it's lost uh, over over its time of being of its inception. It's lost like ninety seven percent of its worth technically, yeah. and most of that happened in nineteen what, 1971 when. Um, you know, Nixon. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, yeah. Cool. I just want to get your take on that. Well, it, it, essentially, I think it's it depends on the blockchain, too. Right. Because, I mean, obviously, there's some blockchains that are uh, very much in, incorporated with uh, with the banks and stuff like that. I don't know how much you know about that, that, it. But. There is the thing is like was a, a cryptocurrency invented for the purpose of inoculating the population to the idea of it, getting them used to it. And then when they're all used to it, say so you can trade it in for this other cryptocurrency, which, by the way, you're going to be paying your taxes in and therefore you have to use it and everyone has to use it. And then everyone can monitor every transaction that's ever done by anyone. Right. Uh, and well, and uh, yeah, that's that's I mean, the original uh, Bitcoin, the original like the gold standard, right, I think was meant to be decentralized and all that kind of stuff. But now, as you say, there's people who want to get their hands and they didn't realize that it would be the way it is, is what it seems like. So, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I, I know what you're saying. The, the real fear is that players, like I can see on even on the channel that we're using now to broadcast this, you can now pay people on Skype directly through Skype. Yeah. OK, and that's one step away from them having a cryptocurrency to facilitate that transfer. So they're not going through the same monetary channels. You've right. got Facebook considering something which is yeah. kind of like sounds like a cryptocurrency, but actually it's not yeah. in the same vein. It's centralized. Yeah. 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 So and, and with their footprint, it's really very scary. Uh, and it should be scary even for 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 countries. Yeah. To oh, I'm, even countries in general. Even yeah, I mean, countries in general. I think most governments, especially, are scared a little bit of, of the potential and which way it goes. We're kind of at a crossroads, right? It seems like. So uh, I don't know if you, how you much you know. Like, there's actually governance thinking. systems too built into some of the blockchains, which I think is yeah, that's. Very, very interesting. All right, well, let's, let's move on because we're not here to talk about cryptocurrency too much, right? I just want to get your take on it. We moved into it. It felt, it felt right. So, um, so how did you first get your start in, in LENR and, and Cold Fusion and all that kind of stuff? Well, I have to say that the, the, the start was, if I carry forward from, from my early years of being interested in alternative energy, and from a farming point of view, that the concept of greenhouse gases uh, 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 connected with me by, way back when. I, I re was an ardent reader of New Scientist, and I'm old enough, being 40, I think I'm 47 now, <laughs> um, <laughs> kind of not lose track after a while. Um, uh, but basically, the, the uh, original Pons and Fleischmann announcement, uh, I, I remember, uh, I was all over it. It was right up my street. And um, uh, then I saw the kind of uh, takedown, as it were. And I thought, you know, this doesn't make any sense to me. Why would these people who are so uh, intelligent and, 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 and have... You know, particularly in the, the case of Fleischmann, they, they had a real name for themselves in the world of electrochemistry and, in, and you know, Raman spectroscopy and, and different uh, aspects of uh, uh, his uh, expertise. He was really at the top level. Why would, why would they put themselves at this risk? And um, uh, th that always left me with a bad taste in my mouth. And uh, I have to be honest that... that um, uh, when, when these things started to get a little bit more uh, uh, exposure in 2011 with the advent of uh, uh, the claims made by uh, one Italian, uh, Alexander, uh, sorry, <laughs> Alexander, <laughs> Andrea Rossi, yeah. um, I, I started uh, paying attention to the current uh, status in the field. Right. I mean, I, I've been to the peak oil conference in 2006 because, you know, I, I, I was that concerned. I self-funded myself to go there and uh, and, and and listen to that and uh, that for me when I came away from that conference and they were saying that look you know even if they ever get a, a fusion you know hot fusion to work they're, they're never going to be able to produce enough fuel and it's, it, they, they might have enough fuel to run a one megawatt test reactor for, for a year but it's going to take a very long time to get that fuel together and and I and and the conference was I mean the, the do you think do you think sorry to interrupt but do you think that that's because of like um the condensed matter physics angle of things, like, do you think it's on that side, or, or you know what I mean? Like, I, what what do you think 
is, is the problem with that approach, with the hot fusion approach? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you've hit the nail on the head is, is that uh, what there's, there's in my view and, and my level of understanding, there is one central and it's, I, I'm going to call it a lie. They say we are trying to create on Earth what goes on in the sun, right? Right. But we're not. Firstly, the sun is something like 98.8% of the mass of the Right. Solar it has a far greater order of magnitude as far as energetic yeah. density. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and um, the gravity is there. Right. So we simply cannot create those things. So they're compensating by increasing the temperatures, which means everything wants to be apart from everything, which means that... It, you have right. to work harder and harder to, to get put it together. To collide. Yeah, and then you're always working in a situation where you're looking for one particle to interact with one particle on a probability basis. Where right. you know and that's even if you've got the deuterium, deuterium, or deuterium and tritium available. Right. It, it, you know that's once you have those things available, and then they're producing fast neutrons, and the fast neutrons are coming out. This is a separate argument. It actually does produce fast neutrons, and that makes right. everything really difficult to contain. Right. And, and but the, the central point is, is that it isn't condensed matter. It's kind of like a, a plasma. It's a plasma, right? Which is uh, you know excited gas essentially, and very yeah. far apart. Um, molecular structure. I mean, very, very far it's apart atoms. Not, not molecular. It's, it, it's barely atomic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you are basically getting atomic deutrons and, and tritons and, and, and trying to get them to hit yeah. each other by having such kinetic... Atomic and uh, even subatomic, really. I mean, it's, it's all subatomic, like, uh, probabilities. And it's like a forceful lottery, I get, right? It'd be like, it's like a forceful lottery. We're, we're just... I, I, I just... I just I, you know, it's wonderful engineering. It keeps a lot of yeah. people employed, but um, I think that's the point. <laughs> I think that's the, and that's the a main issue, right? Employed. Yeah, I and mean, that's the main issue. I think that we're having, and um, you know, this is a bigger, uh, more broad scale, like holistic look at things, I guess. But the social science really is what what is holding us back a lot. If we're if it's always up to funding, then are we really progressing forward? You know, it's kind of like, and it's become it almost becomes like a like it's like religious dogma, and the religion there, is, there is money. There is money for outcomes to occur. You know, in the U.S., for instance, people can easily spend a hundred million on a candidate that fails yeah. in a in a political campaign. But but trying to get the very same people to to open their pocketbooks for a few thousand dollars to do something that literally will fundamentally change the course of humanity. It's like, why? Well, you have to ask, why are yeah. they willing to give so much to a political campaign and they're not, what, what, what do they think they're getting in return for that, which they're not going to get in return or their children is not going to get in return for genuinely changing the course of humanity? That's, I mean, that's, and it's a... There's that's, a question. Yeah. Spiritual, it's like a spiritual, it's like a spiritual question. That, I mean, I... You know, I obviously I wouldn't be able to answer that, but I think that's a very valid point. I think that that's really the heart of the issue of, of most of this and most of progressive science in general is. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100 percent. I mean, in terms of in terms of ITER, like I say, incredible engineering is being done there. I genuinely believe and increasingly believe, but I've said this for the last couple of years. I cannot see that that is how the sun works. It just yeah. I can't see how it works like that. Right. Uh, uh, um, and, and, you know, yes, it works in the case of maybe a, a, an H-bomb, but maybe even the H-bomb is not working like that. Yeah. You know, is, yep. is it layered assumption onto layered assumption and they've, they've built in something that kind of will produce an outcome uh, and the outcome will potentially produce a net energy gain? But is it practical? I don't think it is. I don't think it is. And I think Bill Gates said this himself in 2010. He has a, his own company right. uh, where he's looking to burn like nuclear waste. Yeah. And, and he says the biggest problem is the neutrons that come out and, and they make everything, you know, really difficult to handle later down the line. Even yeah. when you're trying to get rid of nuclear waste, you still end up with a hot thing at the end. Right. And, and, and he says that his, uh, his neutrons are many orders of magnitude less energetic than those that come out of... Uh, hot fusion, right? And, and so you know, um, and, and it's interesting. I, I, since I have mentioned Bill Gates, he he has started looking, you know, under the table, not really under the table, but if you know what, I mean, under the radar, let's right. say it like that. He, he is investing into uh, um, uh, cold fusion, as it's called, 
and and I think I think probably that that shows his intelligence. Yeah, he, yeah, he's keeps he's a very open-minded individual. So um, you know, and he does he reads a lot. It seems like from just from his biography and all that kind of stuff. So that's healthy. I think there's a lot of people. I honestly believe there's a lot more people like that in the world. There's a lot more good out, out there. It's just the good needs to be represented. You know, it needs to be marketed instead of money, right? It needs to be like what we're happy about, what we love to do. I think should be more should be put on a pedestal more you know right now we see mainstream media it's just all this negativity all you know people killing each other yada 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 yet if you look at the data collectively over the years i mean we're living in probably the most abundant time you know for the majority of the planet with the largest population well, ever there's, there's abundant and drawdown we're certainly more effective at drawing down the resources of the planet so right. it, it may feel like abundance now um, but we're, well, we're, survi we're, people surviving too, and everything. Like, just quality of life has gone up in general, yeah. especially since we have you know poor population. You know, and I, don't get me wrong, I I am very much privileged, <laughs> you know, being who I am, and uh, you know, I would not want to be in seven seven billionth place, you know, on this planet. Like, I couldn't even imagine. But in general, I think that we're probably better off than we have been, you know, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. But, you know, then it gets murky. Uh, yes, yes I, I, I would say probably that's true on a materialistic point of view and on a life life chances point of view. Right. You know, if you go back to 120 years ago, you, you're unlikely to meet your fifth birthday or whatever. Right. And, 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 um, n now, no one expects to have two children and not see them graduate. Right. Uh, and we won't go into the, we won't go into the spiritual the, side. Yeah, that's, yeah. Level, <laughs> yeah. I think we're probably pretty much toast. Yeah, well, you know, th there are people out there that are in connection with their spiritual side that they understand the importance of that. I, I did lose it for a while. Uh, I would say that uh, I regained my spirituality uh, um, uh, probably in, in 2017, I, I would say. Yeah, that's, I mean, and I think that's the biggest, uh, well, if you look at it with probability too, though, there's there's a lot a lot of spiritually minded people aren't as vocal a lot of times they're content and happy with themselves happy with their lives so you may not see it very much and with the amount of population you know who really knows but yeah I, I agree with you as far as the Western world goes and what we focus on in our media and stuff like that I I, I agree with you for sure can I hold that I think I have my better half calling me okay all right wait, wait, wait. so yeah if you guys have any questions Jim yes I did say pedestal. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, and yeah, I appreciate you guys on, who are watching live. It's awesome. Uh, I'm trying to get more of these together. I'm so grateful that uh, Bob was willing to come on. Uh, but please, if you have any questions, uh, like as far as your experiments or what you'd like to do or what you'd like him to answer, feel free. Feel free to, to speak up, to type up, I should say. Sorry about that. No worries. It, it was a, a UK uh, um, EU time, and there was a, a time difference of an hour. So my my better half thought I was finishing sooner than I am. So uh, <laughs> let's hope that's okay. <laughs> We're just getting started. Yeah. So I didn't have enough time to shave today. Yeah, neither. Did I. It's Sunday. It's got it, more of the mad scientist look going. Oh on. yeah, exactly. It's rugged. It's rugged. So um, so. What, what do you think was like in history from your research, what do you think was like the first example of LNR or touching on that, on that uh, phenomenon? I think, was, I think it was the first sun in the universe. <laughs> Besides nature, I'm talking about our cognitive grasp of it, like our, our awareness. I, 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 think pro I think probably the first people, um, so are we talking pre-Ice Age or post-Ice Age? Oh, well, I don't, we don't know much about prehistory, so yeah, let's go. <laughs> but the prehistory I, I, thing, I, that's, I, a, I, that's a whole other can of worms. We won't go down that rabbit hole, but just in general. I, I think probably the, the first example of uh, uh, Lena was with um, alchemy. Okay, so um, do you have a reference, like time frame-wise, or any certain... Oh, I don't know. Some people say it's thousands of years old. Some people say it's 5,000 years old. So you're saying like Egyptian, uh, like Baghdad battery, that type of stuff, like still kind of prehistory. What about like in modern, um, our modern grasp of, of history? Like what would you? Well, I, th I think the first biological transmutations, if you look at Jean-Paul Bavarian's book, uh, all, fu uh, all uh, Fusion in All Its Forms, or, or I think he... 
I think in there he cites uh, references from uh, 1790, excuse me, 1798. Okay. Uh, I think the first person to probably uh, uh, realize that he had or was at the time, but po maybe post it he realized, uh, was Tesla. Uh, and that was when he was demonstrating his carbon button lamp. I think it was in... I don't know, 1891, 92, something like that. It was in the, the late 18, uh, 1800s. Yeah. Uh, and he did it in America, and he came to, the I think, the Royal Society and presented there as well. Um, he that, that, because it was carbon, silicon carbide or whatever, I, I think he would have seen a spread of elements being synthesized. Uh, and uh, he was also uh, synthesizing rentogen rays, which later we call x-rays right. probably in the west they call them rentogen labs here in in the east europe but <laughs> yeah more um, it's traditional it's more part of the roots right <laughs> yeah but uh x-rays and and uh, i think if you go to i think it is in the serbia if you go to the museum in there that they have some examples of of exposures that he did I'd, oh look i can see my bones yeah um, <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> So, you know, I, I, given the fact that he was seeing those x-rays and the, the, the uh, you know, um, uh, uh, I, I think probably uh, Tesla was first. And I, I recently did a, a, a blog and a video based on um, uh, Tesla's, I think, 1932, like one of, one of the latter. Oh, yeah. uh, Last uh, things he said. Yeah, yeah. He, he said something about that he was... Uh, doing radiation, uh, uh, like changing the radioactive uh, um, rate of decay, um, and he talked about this and published it in yeah, sort of, I, 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 it I read that eight, article ninety three to six or seven something like that around the time that electrons were were being discovered. Um, he was actually publishing articles around this. So I think, without a shadow of, of a doubt, it would have been him. Uh, when it comes to uh, loading hydrogen uh, into uh, metal, uh, it was um, a guy called Thomas Graham, MRS, yeah. uh, and he was the first uh, head of the Royal Society, and he found uh, uh, in the... Uh, 1930s? No, 18, 1870s, I think. Oh, wow, was. wow. Yeah, uh, even before, long before deuterium and, and neutrons were uh, discovered, that he, the maximum amount you could load any element with hydrogen was, um, deuter sorry, hydrogen into uh, palladium. Yeah. And, uh, and, and basically, that's the level we actually seem to be able to load it even today at the best, best levels. And he said the only way you can really load it is to, is to, um, uh, uh, make, make sure you have no nitrides or oxides on there. For those people that don't know, typically in cold fusion or, uh, or low energy nuclear reactions or condensed matter nuclear science experiments, one of the ways to do this is you take a, a transition metal typically that is able to load hydrogen. You load as much hydrogen in there as possible. And in the case of uh, titanium, you know, you're more flexible. In the case of palladium, you really want to load deuterium. It seems to work with deuterium better. Um, but uh, uh, that, that's essentially what I'm talking about there. So have you got any questions right now that want to be asked, you, asked here? Um, no, not uh, just... Jay Price says heavy water isn't that expensive. No, it isn't. Uh, I actually have some in the other room. Um, but it, it depends on the volumes you want, and you really don't want the oxygen in there, so you actually only want the deuterium. Uh, and it's the tritium that's really, really uh, unpleasantly expensive. Um, so uh, it has a short uh, uh, shelf life, so to speak, right? It has a decay rate, like uh, a, uh, tritium. Yeah, it's yeah. Like ten years or something like that. Yeah. So, um, so you need to make manufacture on that. Now, one way that they look at doing that is that the neutrons that are all bad and 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 make your reactor hot. You have a lithium blanket, and lithium has a very good high level of bonds for stopping the neutrons. And when the neutrons go in, they actually synthesize tritium. And so uh, the idea is that your lithium blanket would actually breathe the tritium that you need in in combination with the the deuterium. Uh, um, that's so, that's cool. That's I did not know that that part know. of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. So, what experiment do you think? What experiment interests you the most right now at the present moment? Any in particular that you know? Uh, what you mean in in the in the, the field? For, in, in the field, yeah, for LNR. Um, I I think experiments that are able to demonstrate transmutation. Um, 
I think uh, the, the the challenge with uh, excess heat is that yeah, um, it's always able to be criticised, and so you get into this kind of whole argument about did you have the calibration right? Did did you did you use the right type of way of measuring the temperature? Did you measure your input power correctly? Uh, um, who, who, are, are the instruments calibrated right. are you the right qualification to know that all these things are correct yeah that's um, been a challenge from from my my research for sure it, it, it's absolutely endless uh, yeah. and, and so you know there's always a way to stop these things um uh, then there is the uh, transmutation to other elements now uh, this is a much higher level of evidence uh, but then you always get these things l like a uh, Andrew Johnson calls them Agent Smiths, and it's kind of like you get these people, they pop up and they go, it's not possible, go and read a textbook, you cannot transmute elements, right. it's not possible. Right. It's like, hold on, hold on a minute, um, are, are you alive? And they go, yes. Right, do you have any calcium in your body? <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Do, do, do you have any carbon in your body? Uh, yes. <laughs> Both of those are transmuting right now in your body every second of your life. It's true, biologically, yes. Well, no, not just naturally. Yeah, well, I mean, that's na that's nature is to take the oh, base elements and make more. Nitrogen, you know, right? Uh, yeah, that's uh, we uh, wouldn't uh, exist uh, without it. We know it. We know that nature does fuse elements, and there is transmutation, and things are constantly changing and evolving, because otherwise we wouldn't be here, right? So we know that for sh for certain. So I see I see your point, but whether that comes well, across in, in somebody in both of those cases, it's it's a they're emitting a beta in the well, in the case of potassium 40 it can go one of three ways but uh, it predominantly emits a beta uh, and, uh, and goes to calcium 40 so sorry but if you have potassium in your body rather right which we all know we, we do we do so potassium 40 uh, one of the, its main decay channels is, to, is by remi uh, emitting a beta and that yeah. goes to uh, calcium 40 and and uh, the the carbon 14 which is the basis for radiocarbon dating right. is going to uh, uh, nitrogen 14 so these are things that are going on all the time so transmutation is real it's happening in every single living thing on earth right so let's let's get that out of the way um <laughs> Uh, so, so I think and, and it could be it could be that just some people are, have such a uh, specialized approach at looking at science where it's just in one skill set rather than looking at a larger picture. Maybe that's the maybe that's one of the big problems that a lot of people have. You know, it's, it seems so empty because they're not looking at it with that large uh, scope. Well, you're absolutely right. And so when I was at Aarhus University, I, I had a, a moment in time where I really realized that, the, that not, not only that, that there are uh, disciplines that are separated and they have their own lexicon and so forth, that they also have a huge universe between them. And so if you look in the chemistry lab, because they're using borosilicate glass vessels like this uh, Kafola cup here, and it melts, starts to soften at 300 degrees, or they're, they're using maybe other... Uh, types of apparatus uh, containment. They really want to, for industrial processes, they want to have most industrial processes occurring below 300 degrees centigrade. Um, preferably, definitely not above 600 degrees centigrade. You should start running out of materials that can quite quickly, it. that you can actually contain things right. with. So they like to look for catalytic processes. That's a whole other question. What is a catalytic process? <laughs> but anyway, so uh, they're, they're in the sort of 300 degrees centigrade. And then when you go over to the physics lab over the road, uh, they are starting at millions and millions and millions and millions of degrees. <laughs> There's a lot in between that they're There's they're kind of skipping. <laughs> yeah, that no one's looking at. Yeah, that's not true. There's a guy called I think Kazagi, uh, and he won uh, the Preparator Medal uh, in in uh, Sendai ICCF 21 uh, a couple of years ago. Or in fact, that was mm, last year, was it? Uh, anyway, uh, in, in, in Sendai, ICC, ICC, ICCF 20, rather, and that was a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, he actually looked at uh, um, uh, energy levels below uh, uh, the sort of 4.5 mega electron volts that your typical sort of uh, cyclotron will speed up uh, uh, your proton to. Right, to uh, break the Coulomb barrier, right? Yeah, to yeah. smash it into a piece of right. lithium and right. do a cockroach walton uh, experiment. You know, you, up to millions of electron volts or whatever. Right. Um, 
and and he actually found that there were resonances where way way below that you could you could achieve uh, nuclear effects. And in fact, there's there's one researcher, the Lipinski brothers, that have this uh, type of fusion. Um, I think it's Quantum Gravity Corporation or whatever. But anyway, oh, yeah. um, uh, they they were actually looking at, and I think it was 222.1 elect electron volts. I mean, you could use a, a domestic power supply to accelerate something to this uh, uh, energy. Um, uh, they were able to get protons to interact with seven lithium. So um, uh, the jury's still out on that. You know, there are right. uh, groups that are looking at maybe replicating that. One of them actually discussed that, um, who's, I think, working at MIT, and they've actually got a piece of either their apparatus or uh, uh, analog of it. And uh, they did a, a lecture on, you know, getting that up to spec and, and think they're going to investigate the Lipinski uh, proton uh, seven lithium uh, fusion experiment. Uh, but uh, certainly the Kazagi work has shown that this, this immense area of temperatures between the chemistry department and the physics department actually has areas in there which uh, are open for exploration that could actually uh, uh, yield uh, outcomes. Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and, and when you go to the chemistry uh, physics department there and you say, well, you know, you, you know, it would appear that some of these systems that have been reported on historically, they're actually, um, you know, uh, what, how shall I say it? They, they are transmuting matter at a faster rate, uh, i.e. so the radioactive decay of one element to another is is uh, uh, in, uh, the in decay, decay rate is increased. Right. And uh, and actually, you know, I, I heard someone at, at that university say to me, you know, well, this is just impossible. And oh, well, that's what and that's what Bill Gates is trying to do. I mean, that's right to go full circle back. I mean, he's essentially trying to use I think I believe his approach is with fission. To, right. But. Well, with fission, you can effectively burn things uh, using the neutrons that come out, making right. unstable element isotopes that then decay. And then if, if, if they're still big enough to be knocked into an unstable regime, then they decay and, and, right. and so on. So you, it, it's called nuclear burning. Right. Uh, and what you do is you end up with stuff that's uh, got shorter like half-lives or, or less energetic or, or whatever. You, you, but you're any, gaining energy during that process. So... Um, what, what we are looking at, or seemingly looking at, um, uh, and it's very interesting because uh, it would seem to be that it's atomic hydrogen that's absolutely key to this process. Uh, and, Seems like it. <laughs> uh, well, in the case of nickel hydrogen systems, you're looking to catalytically split uh, uh, di molecules or hydrogen, right. H2 or D2. Di dihydrogen, yeah. Yeah, catalytically split those so that you have uh, radicals. So you, you've right. got a proton with no electrons, proton with one electron, and protons with two electrons. So you've got the various thing there. But the proton with no electrons is, uh, well, proton with one electron is kind of like atomic hydrogen, but pr proton alone uh, then seems to be able to uh, do some really, really interesting things. And uh, 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 there's a guy called Langmuir, uh, and I think in the 20s or 30s, yeah. and he produced this thing called the Langmuir torch. So you have hydrogen coming out. There's an arc discharge that yes. is by using the arc discharge is creating atomic hydrogen. And he, uh, as far as I understand it, reported transmutations. But then he was asked to walk that back and retract what he said. Right now, if you bring that right up to the the, the current understanding that we have right now, uh, there's this. Uh, uh, um, a uh, guy uh, who I had the pleasure of visiting in uh, Japan, and he invented this technology in uh, the, the late 1990s, but uh, actually got it patented in 2001. And he's called Roishi Namaza, and he's got, he produces this uh, vibration system and, and this gas, and this gas is, um, it's kind of like uh, the gold standard of Brown's gas. Right. Like Brown did this thing in the 70s or, or something, even before that maybe. Yep, yeah. um, but he demonstrated that it was able to remediate or change the decay rates of isotopes extremely, extremely quickly. Right. So, for instance, the case of cobalt-60 and in the case of uh, uh, um, americium-241, the sort of thing that in the U.S. you will have in your smoke detector, he was able to take americium-241, put it on a, on a ceramic block, put some aluminium uh, uh, shavings and some iron shavings in there, put on the Brown's gas, which is basically oxyhydrogen gas, pre-mixed. Right. Um, ostensibly stoichiometric, uh, uh, the same number you, you, you have in water uh, uh, in the gas, right. uh, hydrogen and oxygen. 
and and a few seconds exposure and then you've got this flash and like 97 or whatever percent is is removed from the amaricim 241 which is it's just absolutely crazy and this was demonstrated in in 1991 so right um the implication is that that you can massively change the decay rate now it's interesting because in a uh, a, a YouTuber challenged or, or had some questions about a, a reactor called Sapphire, which was designed to yeah. test the electric sun model. Yeah, we were going to get into that. Yeah, the electric yeah, universe well, and all that stuff, definitely. Yeah, well, basically, the, 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 the guy Montgomery Charles mentioned in that particular video uh, that at MIT, they have shown that using uh, atomic hydrogen, they could massively change the decay rate of hydrogen. So here you have you have a whole bunch of scientists that they're angel then, smiths and they're saying yeah. this is impossible, and then you have MIT that's saying this is possible. But by the way, Browns did this a long time ago, and if you look, we, and we've already published on our uh, uh, Facebook channel, um, we, we that that uh, I think in the. 2000s, at some point in the 2000s, or it may have been uh, uh, more recently, uh, the gas from Roishina Maza, this Amaza gas, was tested and it contained 0.2% of atomic hydrogen. Now, it might not sound a lot, but this can be stored for 10 years. And then you can just get it out and you can then, in theory, do this radiation remediation. And so I, 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 I wanted to talk about, uh, uh, or the, the, coming back to the excess heat situation, it, it would seem that when you get a lot of excess heat with these kind of low-energy nuclear reaction systems, uh, it starts to cause reactors to fail. And when you've had a failure, it's very difficult to say that the elements that are in there are not contamination because the thing melted down. Right. And took half, half of the apparatus with it. Or <laughs> that's so, and sorry to interrupt, but that's honestly why I don't go towards that approach towards the uh, the hotter of the cold fusion approach approaches because of that reason. I think that. Uh, if it's con contained in a medium that's that's dense enough to be able to handle the interactions like like a aqueous cell, I think that that is my my approach is more that direction because I'm worried about uh, um, if there is a breakdown like the cont contaminants and how it's interacting with the other elements in the reactor itself. I'd like to really just narrow it down to just a few components and keep it simple. What do you think about that? Do you think aqueous is not uh, the way to go or? Well. Uh, um I, I think it, it, when you have a fluid in contact with a solid, uh, both of those things have high electron density. Um, so they are, in a way, condensed matter. The beauty of a fluid is that is it is not locked in place and it can take away thermal energy. So here's the, uh, hold on one second, I gotta jump in because think about this. What, what happens when you create, when you make that fluid turn into a solid, like super fluidity? I, there's a research paper that recently happened, it's, um, there, there, I think it's in the range of 40, 40 C. Sorry, that was my dryer buzzer. In the range of 40 C, there is a, uh, there is a like an organizational pattern that happens in water. Uh, I can, I can link you. I don't know if you've read it. I can link you it. But then it's condensed on condensed, and you're channeling the uh, the thermal and hydro hydrodynamic motion across. So like like. You know, like breeding, almost like uh, what hot fusion is trying to do with their plasma in a sense. What do you think about that approach? That's kind of an approach that I've been experimenting I, I, with. I think water is very clearly a very interesting thing. Uh, uh, it's, it's necessary for life. I don't think anyone doubts that. Uh, uh, and I think what's going to happen in the next uh, uh, 10, 15 years is people are going to understand a lot more about why it's so necessary for life. It's, it's a medium through which life can exist. Uh, uh, it's a medium that life needs in itself. Uh, 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 it's in, in, in everything you eat and, and, and you know, to, to a certain degree. And it has an abundance of elemental number one, hydrogen, like we talked about, and it's... And it's yeah. yeah, but I mean, what Roisin Amaza has found is that um, uh, there are water clusters like buckyballs yeah. uh, within its material, and uh, maybe they are able to store... They, they, they certainly appear to be denser, like it's like more solid water. <laughs> <laughs> right, but it's but in fact it's in the form of a gas. But right. when you burn it, ends up being water again. But is it, is it the so, same water? I don't know. So that's so, a, the, the, that's the two things I'm like kind of I've been going over my mind a lot too, and um, especially with Amaza, like it's um it's it's really interesting because how he produces the gas, what temperature range is he getting getting that water when he's putting the vib uh, you know mechanical oscillations into it? What temperature range does it go up to? Or he has to preset it to a certain temperature, right? 
So what, what, what I will say is that, um, and I have one of the vibrator plates here, but people can go on the MFMP's uh, YouTube channel. I highly I recommend it. YouTube, yeah. YouTube channel. Um, but uh, this is one of the plates. Uh, you can see from the size of my hand uh, how roughly how large that is. And uh, what he does is a, a, a non-direct coupled uh, vibration system that's uh, vibra vibrating. Uh, in the case of the uh, uh, hydrogen generator, it's vibrating uh, at around about 60 hertz. But in the case of the transmuter, it's vibrating at like three times that. Right. Um, uh, but that's the fundamental frequency. And, and it's kind of vibrating like this. It's vibrating like this. And it's vibrating like that. Yeah. Um, and within that, you've got modes of vibration this way. And because of the way it's held, it snaps as well. It kind of like cracks like a whip. And, and so uh, you get all kinds of resonant modes with sound on here. And you can see that where those resonant modes uh, do right. uh, some level of interaction, this is my interpretation, that you are getting uh, 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 some kind of energy concentration, which allows when you look at these under the SEM. Like cavitation, uh, right? Because you're making... Well, yeah. Yeah, well <laughs> Is it sa interacting sound waves in here that are causing an energy concentration, like a, a wave this way, a wave that way, a wave that way, a wave that way, right. and it's causing such an energy concentration, which is resonant, that you get to a point where a nuclear event causes the cavitation bubble, right. or are you saying a cavitation bubble causes a nuclear event? It's See, that's a great, and yeah, that's a great question to ask. That's really the, yeah, totally the, I think you, like, that, put it very simply, that's the question that we all have is, is it from within or from, or from mechanic? Like, I, I almost look at it this way, like in nature too, you look at it with balance, right? And anytime that there's a void of energy, like we try to go to absolute zero, right? With using laser, um, uh, you know, standing node, vibe, you know, oscillations or frequencies, right? To create these pockets of super cooled area. And we can never go to absolute because energy is always trying to rush in. It's always trying to come in, even no matter how much we block it. So that's, I think that goes into that very same statement that you said, that's what we need to f sort out, right? I, I agree with you. So if there's nuclear events going on on just on the vibration plate, is it setting up a, a, a type of uh, condensed matter or is it the cavitation bubble that's causing the re-entrant jets, right. the Leclerc and those kind of uh, ideas uh, of uh, uh, um, more? Uh, and are, are they then... Uh, shooting, as, as Moro would say, through the electrolysis plates and, and self-organizing these water clusters. And, and, and as essentially, the, the, it's, it's not hydrogen coming off one side or oxygen coming off the other side. It's supposedly this channel in the middle where some other type of uh, version of bubbles a, appear. And is it capturing those? Yeah, and like, a toroid, like a toroid or, um, you know, like the classic pictures of a black hole type of deal, like where this center of the center of mass so so to speak to put it to put it simply is uh, where all like the energetic happenings is going on yeah so basically th this gas gas is then synthesized and it seems to have some of the properties of um, uh, uh, brown's gas and i didn't really know what the properties of brown's gas were <laughs> but one of them i did know because i recently researched it because i was looking at radiation remediation so so the idea is if, if this thing gets really hot and it mashes up all the elements and at the end of the process you get a load of stable elements, well, can we use this to take already nasty waste uh, and and uh, learn about the process whilst we are dealing with the waste? And when we know, we've done dealt with the waste and, and, and so on, we'll really understand Lena and how maybe it can be contained and so forth. So uh, it was really exciting. He, he wanted me to mostly look at the plates, and, and, and that was great because I could learn about what really was going on on the plates. And so we could establish that it wasn't low frequency that was only there. I mean, there was definitely low frequency, and it was the fundamental. It was most of the energy. But right. 23 decibels below that, there's a very large amount of ultrasonics going on. Right. Is that coming from the, 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 the resonant on here and then an, a, a, a Sub. Event? or Or is it coming from a collapsing crack of, of a, a, um, a cavitation bubble, whatever. Right. The, the point was that, that, that we established that more interesting things than were originally thought were going on. This would explain why in the 2000s, when he had sent off some of his uh, water, which was deionized to start with, and he sent it off to be tested, that he found a large proportion of the, the lighter elements up to kind of like all the ones that you would have in your body in the uh, um, water that was exposed to the, the subtle vibration. 
And this might explain, and or it certainly explains for me, why the fish that he ha has in his lab, and, we, and he sells these systems to people that are growing fish and, and eels for consumption, they grow much more healthy, they grow hmm. uh, uh, bigger, they grow faster. And my, my view is that it may be actually creating bioavailable monoatomic elements. So it's actually synthesizing elements. And, and, and I did a test, and we, we have this calculator that we've developed at a, a site called nanosoft.co.nz. And if you put into one of the uh, Cascades 5 light, if you put in 1H1H and you put the energy levels to 0.1 MeV, 0.1 MeV, and, and, uh, and you set the uh, reaction uh, uh, recursion level to 7, it will come up with pretty much every element that you have uh, in your body, uh, starting from just protons and protons. And, of course, with water, you've also got hydrogen that you may be able to play with as well. Right. So you're ending up, potentially, with a system that would appear, at least on a scientific, we start off with deionized water, we flap, flap the blade around in it. There's no electrolysis going on, by the way. Yeah, that's, that. that's what's no, surprising. Right, right. No electrolysis going on. So what happened was, is that, you know, he was trying to make water clean. And I guess, and I'm not saying that this was his thinking, but I guess that if he's trying to say, I want, make, want to purify water, but actually what I'm ending up with is a load of elements that weren't there to begin with, people might worry about that. But anyway, that's, that's apparently what was happening. And that, that information was part. I, personally, I would have liked him to have come out with it at, at that point right. for, for his own good at that time to get it on the record. But what happened after Fukushima, he thought, well, if this is actually transmuting elements, maybe it could transmute elements and deal with radioactive uh, uh, water from right. Fukushima. How, so how, are the, how are the plates treated before it goes through the process, though? Do they go through like well, some type of ultrasonification they're, they're bath and... Not normally they're just normal stainless steel plates cut into shape and put in put in place. So I, I know with electrolysis and HHO generators, they will do chemical treatments or sandblast them and, and do other things to create uh, places which would have maybe catalytic or, or energy concentration effects on the surface or for nucleation of bubbles or whatever. Right. But I, just these these things are really quite rudimentary and simple. And and so the, the idea is that... Um, he was thinking that maybe it's in the, see as it seems to be creating elements or manipulating matter perhaps it will do what in this is my view is that we already know nature wants to go from unstable to stable because that's what radioactive decay does right it starts off as unstable things and over time which could be a long time by the way it ends up with stable but if this is able to synthesize elements in a very fast way into bioavailable elements could it possibly do the thing the other way like encourage it to unsynthesize <laughs> you know what i mean right right but do it in a safe way and so he took the plate, a plate system, in a concealed container and put Fukushima water in there. And with a TV crew, I'm told, I believe, but I don't know, I don't have the facts, but this is what I'm told. There were uh, TEPCO engineers, uh, engineers from the Nuclear Authority or whatever, and, and politicians. And in 13 days, it removed one half-life from cesium-137, which should be over 30 years. Right. And in a further uh, 17 days, it took another roughly a half-life. So two half-lives were gone in one month instead of 60 years plus, right? That's pretty that impressive. absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. That was, but unfortunately, though, that's, that's mired in like a rumor, right? Unless you have, you have actual documentation of, of that process. No, no, the, like... the, the, the tests were done, and, and I've published the videos on our channel of the data. Okay. And, and, uh, but for some reason, they didn't, the TV crew didn't publish their data, and they didn't take up on his offer of supplying these things to you, you know, fix the radiation water. Right. Now we've got 1.2 million tons or something of water that there's an argument between the Japanese and, and, and the South Koreans of shooting. Right. Right. be poisoning the uh, uh, Pacific with this, right. which, by the way, you probably swim in, and you don't want all of that water coming your way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah in it, Oregon. Right? Yeah, so, yeah, it's probably, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, the point is, is that it's frustrating. This was done in 2012, and here we are in 2000, and nearly at the end of 2019, or coming up to it. And why isn't it being done? Well, maybe, but just maybe, the Agent Smiths popped up, and they couldn't believe that this could happen, even though it's like, don't believe your lying eyes. Don't believe them. Don't believe the fact that the sealed chamber, the, the radiation change. Don't believe it because it's not possible because there's a textbook over there that tells you it's not possible. And if right. you don't know that it's not possible, go and read the textbook. Yeah, okay? that's a, that's, and, and then you go into, like, it's 
you're you're falling into po politics and spiritual and spirituality because in a like in a way because uh, look at it like this i think it was gandhi said right and this is very spiritual leader type of person but he said um you know first first they don't believe you then they deny what you have to say and then eventually it becomes accepted but it takes time because people have to be uh, like more spiritually inclined to it, I have to relate to it somehow. I, I feel to give, so. To give them credit and some leeway, you know, firstly you have people saying that transmutation is not possible. Sorry, it's happening in your body every single second of every single day. Right. Anyway, uh, and that is decay. Uh, it's unforced decay. And the idea that you can't force a system to do what it naturally wants to do anyway is a little bit bizarre to me. Um, but so you, you, you have this system and, 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 and effectively um, uh, what, what uh, uh, is, is, is surprising about this is that um, it's, it has it smacks of a bit of what Yul Brown had done in 1991 with his uh, uh, forcing of the decay, making the faster the decay rate in cobalt 60 and the americium 241. So you have two systems here that are doing a, a similar thing uh, uh, in, in, in one respect. And the other thing is that, that, that we, we know already from cavitation bubbles that in the case of cavitation bubbles, they have been able to synthesize elements from the work of Leclerc and his partner, uh, a nanospire. And, and this is where they were either using like an aluminium drum with holes drilled in it and spinning around inside a PVC pipe and don't want to do it, it it'll kill you because of things that it emits. But um, it was synthesizing all of the elements in the periodic table and even some transuranics. Um, this is pushing energy in the system. This is maybe tickling the system so that it decays, does what it wants to do actually. And so... Um, you know, we already know cavitation bubbles can s synthesize elements. So my view was when I went over there is I know he says that he's only vibrating at 160, uh, 179 hertz maximally. Right. That's the but that's uh, the that's the carrier wave, the overall mechanical carrier wave, the kinetic that, energy. That's, that's but, what's forcing the bulk of the right. system. Right. But that's not I, necessarily. I, I, I thought that this has to be producing cavi cavitation bubbles, and so there will be some <laughs> ultrasonic signatures of that. Right. So I prepared it's, a hydrophone. They're phonons. And things. And, you know, within the first day, within the first hours of getting access to the system, we already knew it was producing ultrasonics. Right. You know, from the hydrophone and from an external right. microphone. From, it's phonon, phonon vibration, when it, you know, it's like... Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so, so we already knew it was producing ultrasonics. Then... Uh, after some negotiation, we got access to look at a plate. And I was handed the plate, and in, in the light of the window, uh, with, with approximately 2.3 seconds, I don't know, I'm joking there, but maybe three seconds of looking at it, I could already see the, the, the marks on the plate. So I, I already knew, but it was already telling me that it's not just all over the plate, it's at, at points at which it's favorable for those things to occur. Under the microscope, it became obvious that there that, that was uh, uh, cavitation involved. And right. in the slow motion videos, you can even see the bubbles going around and moving around. I've already seen these things in India when I was looking at Suhas right. Ralkar's work, who is an expert in ultrasonics, and it was admittedly producing vast amounts of cavitation. So I knew what I was looking at. And so we knew there was a mechanism. And the mechanism is cavitation that's already been demonstrated to transmute matter. Right. So therefore, they now had a mechanism. And and, and so uh, uh, they were actually doing this experiment where they, they, were at, they had deionized water. They were adding 5% uh, uh, deuterium oxide, so heavy water. And then they were adding magnesium chloride into the water hmm. and then they did some water purification tests like you would want to do if you would wanted to find out whether you know you were getting rid of uh, nasty things in your water and because for, for for a fish farm for instance right so you, you had all these water ion tests and one of the ion tests they were looking for was for iron i mean not ion but iron right <laughs> Right. And, and, I, and I said, you know, this is great. It does look like it's done a, a, a synthesized quite a bit of iron. The problem is, is that there's iron in the steel plates. And if there's cavitation and it is digging away or channeling that thing, it may be just stripping out iron from 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 the surface. Right. And then I thought, well, OK, let's let's go and look at the calculator. And it turns out that magnesium chloride makes iron when it fuses together. And so. <laughs> 
it's kind of like, um, and I need to check that. I'm just doing that off the top of my head. But whatever they were using ended up synthesizing iron preferentially. Um, and 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 so uh, by the time the Nikkei reporter, science reporter, came, staff writer came round. That's the, one of the leading newspapers in, in uh, Japan in Tokyo. By the time that came round, it, this was halfway through day three. We'd already found out the mechanism. We already found out, you, you, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we had some demonstration that it might be doing what it said on the tin. Um, uh, and, and it's just a shame that, that this couldn't have been done in 2012. And then rather than having 1.2 million tons or whatever it is of, of toxic water and running out of space to store it, they would have a lot of water that you could I wouldn't say drink, but yeah. certainly you're not going to yeah. make a lot of toxic sooner. You could put it. You, know? you could actually put it into the ocean without it being as harmful, type of deal. Well, well right. essentially not harmful at all. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then, so then there's that, and then you have the fact that is the atomic hydrogen being synthesized at this point, and that's doing the work, and that that's creating these synthesized elements. And is that being packaged into these bubbles that's produced in the electrolyte? And then that's synthesizing this gas called a Marza gas, which seems to have some properties, as I said, of Brown's gas. And so my eye concept was, is that essentially um, what it looks like is that nature is trying to pack things into a very small box. Okay. And uh, the reason is, is because you tend to get uh, elements that occupy less uh, uh, distortion of the physical vacuum out of the process. So by... If you take two deuterons, uh, they occupy, let's say, one, one uh, unit of space-time. Uh, helium occupies one unit of space-time. That's four helium. In fact, three helium o occupies one unit of space-time. So the, the reason that when you merge uh, two deuterons together, you get a huge energy gain is because you, you are releasing that uh, uh, energy that's released from uh, less distortion in the structure of the, the physical vacuum. Mm. And so... Um, uh, in, it, if, if you just take that alone, that's already telling you what nature wants to do. But just look at what the the, the many uh, sort of what you have in the center of the earth. It's like supposedly iron and nickel. Well, iron yeah. 56, nickel 62 are very, very. The balance, well the universal uh, balance as far as matter. Yeah. They, they're very well packed uh, arrangements of nucleons, i.e. there's a lot of nucleons occupying a very little amount of space time relatively to most of the other atoms in the periodic table. The right. I, so, yeah, I think uh, I was looking at the abundance tables um, of stable elements in the universe and yeah, iron's like dead smack in the middle. So yeah, that's, I totally know what, what you mean. So, so essentially, if it's trying to pack it into a small box, then uh, one of the classic uh, 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 transmutations is where you take uh, uh, carbon uh, and and you you oh, sorry you you take carbon and it makes uh, um, uh, iron. But you take carbon, a couple of twelve volt batteries, and this is a called George Osawa. He was a Japanese guy that came to the U.S. He, he uh, invented the macrobiotic diet, but one of his <laughs> other things was uh, uh, doing spark discharges between carbon on carbon. Yeah. Uh, uh, and he was finding iron in there. Now he was also finding other elements that are necessary for life. And essentially what you've got there is lightning and carbon. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, you've got an intense electron uh, uh, density um, uh, increase there. Uh, and uh, you're, you're synthesizing uh, iron. Now, one path to iron is you, you're, you're kind of like you're doing it in air. So you've got nitrogen, it's 78% of air. Uh, so carbon and nitrogen infusing, they're making al aluminium 27. 227 aluminium atoms are making iron 54. And so you are taking uh, four nucleons, uh, two carbons, two nitrogens, and you are making uh, one nucleon of iron, iron uh, uh, 54. Uh, so there's a guy called Bokris who uh, was uh, 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 worked with um, Fleischmann and a guy called Sundaresan, and they replicated this work, but they have a different take on it. It's, it's two carbons and two oxygens are fusing together, and they're producing iron 56 and, and, and four helium. Um, so the, the work has been, this particular work has been replicated by many, many people. Right, and well, even the foundation is in Tesla, like his, uh, his carbon button lamp, right? 
I mean, exactly. Yeah. So he will, he will likely have seen synthesis of elements because he he puts it in a near vacuum. Maybe there's some noble gas in there, but let's say it's a near bit near vacuum. And he's got a silicon carbide. Yeah, he's got silicon and carbon, and then whatever the the insulator is for that carbon button lamp. And then he's getting all these other elements. Where do they come from? Right. You, you know. So so um, there's a lot to be given credit to Tesla. Now, uh, um, essentially. If, if it's packing into a small box, then when you get elements beyond iron, uh, sorry, nickel 62, they start to become less efficient. Uh, let's imagine that they come long and stringy. They're not in a little sphere. And so what you do is you need to break those up and the, 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 the break, broken part actually occupies less of the spa space time than, than the bit connected together. So this is what happens when you take uranium-235, the most beautiful... Uh, nuclei in the universe, <laughs> in, our, in our universe, um, uh, and and you split that in two, and uh, and there are probabilities uh, of the way it splits, but typically you uh, some of the elements you get out cesium one thirty seven and strontium ninety, and these elements because of the the organisation of the nucleons occupy uh, less space time, and so it's trying to find solutions to this where the products in fission occupy less distortion of the structure of the physical vacuum and the, the the balance is energy that gets released and this is even true of chemical energy if you look at the work of Stoy and Stark he even goes and argues that and, and so wh whatever the energy is coming from it's through le la lowering the uh, uh, the amount of space-time distortion so it, now uh, or, or it, yeah like the data the amount of data packed into a system if you look at in that uh, yeah, term of data it's more data packed it's right. more condensed matter it's right. trying to condense matter the, actually condensed matter nuclear science is a really good name for it and so let's let's say you have a structure whatever the structure is and it's able to pack things into a really really small box and it wants to squit put in small box and like if everything's coming in, it wants to go in and it's trying to get it more into this small box because this, this structure doesn't want to grow, but it, it can still throw things into the middle. Well, the, there's there's two concepts of matter here and it's like um, uh, uh, two kind of types of matter. It's like if you have integer spin, then you're a, a boson. If you have non-integer spin, you, you, you're, you're a fermion. And But fermions like electrons unless they're in a Cooper pair, they can't occupy the same space time. And, and so they have to be apart from each other. But if, if and that's the same with nucleus. If, if a nucleus uh, uh, is a fermion, it can't occupy the same space time. So if you take 227 aluminium, they can't occupy the same space time. But if you're squeezing them, squeezing them, they're going to go, all right, I'll give up. I'm going to try and organize myself into a nucleon where we can live in the same space time. So if they fuse into iron 54, they're then into just spin and then iron 54 nuclei can occupy the same right. space time. Right. And so you get something that has a lot right. of matter in a very, 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 very small space. Now, it kind of looks a bit like a black hole. <laughs> yeah. It's, so it's that's. Like so and uh, so and yeah. I, I'm gonna go into some. This is some really deep because I really want your perspective on this. This is some really well, deep I, I, I need science. To explain. Okay, all right. Okay, go, on. go ask me a question. It will go into that. It, will, it this, I think it ties right into this. So, uh, you're aware of like a helium superfluidity, right? And condensed matter physics, right? Have you researched at all hydrogen superfluidity and or um, metallic hydrogen, as it's called? And because uh, I, I personally have tried, I've made it uh, a quest for the past couple of years to look at every paper I could. And most of them are, you have to pay, you have to pay to learn. And like, not, it's not cheap either. So um, you have well, an... uh, <coughs> Sci Hub. <coughs> <dot TW. laughs> okay. Thank you. That's, I appreciate that. Yeah. Because uh, I mean, seriously, like. I dash H U B dot T W. <coughs> okay. Cool. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. So, because uh, because tying into what you're saying, like um, you know, the, the there's this a su there's abundance of what you're talking about iron, and then obviously hydrogen is also incredibly abundant abundant in the universe, and um, so is oxygen. You know, the elements that make us basically, uh, and it's I find it fascinating that there there's a, this talk about gravitational forces and stuff like that, and how matter plays into it, and uh, and and yet there's no talk about condensed matter physics, except for like a very small few, I think, in black hole research. Very small. I, I, like, I, there's a, a Spaniard guy I know who's very heavily involved in it. But um, what's your take on that? Like, and how does it 
do you think that it's part of like the electric universe? Like, what I guess the best ex- uh, question to ask would be like. Okay, let, let, let me answer your question. So, so you're okay. saying are, are different uh, states of hydrogen clustering or or, or, or whatever uh, are the, are they playing a role? I, I will say that if you look uh, using sci-hub.tw uh, at, at the work of Matsumoto, he was a Japanese nuclear expert, uh, worked at Sapporo, uh, the university there. Right. And uh, he started uh, doing and replicating fusion experiments in 1989. By, uh, I think, 1990, he had published his uh, first theoretical understanding of what was going on. And I think in 1991, uh, certainly by 1992, he had shown and had written specifically that there are uh, uh, basically like a condensate of, of, of uh, hydrogen. And right. so uh, in one phrase, I think it is saying that nickel is not able to absorb hydrogen. But what happens on the surface, is it forms this condensation. It forms this incredibly dense thing. And he actually showed... Uh, SEMs of frost of what he calls frost of hydrogen and droplets of hydrogen. Hmm. And he specifically says that the this form of uh, maybe atomic hydrogen is then able to transmute matter in a way that it's going uh, uh, proton by proton. But it seems Subatomic. also... Y- y- uh, well, you fire a proton into m- most elements and it- it- it'll progress ac- across the, the periodic right. table right. Uh, uh, if you keep doing it. Uh, and and so this is the theory of one guy called uh, Francesco Piantelli. And if you look at his uh, patent, which is valid, uh, it's a cold fusion patent, which is valid till 2032. The guy is 86. I saw him last week or the week before. He's he's rudely clear in his mind, uh, but his physical, uh, 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 you know, the the thing that we have to walk around in is is not really up to keeping up with mind. Happened to us all. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Anyway, he, I, I recommend anyone that's interested in this field really need to go and l- look at the work of Francesco Piantelli. He, he discovered nickel hydrogen system in a biology experiment in, in uh, um, uh, 1989. It was in August 1989. And he, he had this like um, uh, brain cell, I think, from a mouse. And that he was studying like what happens when a brain starts to lose oxygen, they start to die. What happens uh, 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 in the chemistry such that um, but essentially what happens is that the, the understanding was that it produces a chemical that prevents the cell from dying. It kind of like shuts up, puts force shields up, right? Mm-hmm. But after a while, the force shields are so strong that if the, the, the brain cell gets a oxygen again, the, it can't go through the force shield and so the brain cell dies anyway. So you, you have a – it tries to protect itself, but the protection itself ends up killing the brain cell anyway. And, and so what he was looking at was the chemistry that ha- changes over time. And he was looking that um, when, when you uh, uh, re-put uh, the oxygen in, uh, it was the drugs that you could put into the brain cell or, or bathe it in or whatever that would prevent this kind of like ultimately self-destructing process. Ah, that's very interesting. Yeah. And so he, what he was doing is he had a little electrode and, and, and the brain cell was supported on a piece of pure nickel. You don't want to contaminate it. And that was the counter electrode. And he was doing stimulating uh, electrical char- discharges through it to keep the brain cell alive electrically. Um, and, and then uh, he would have it in a, a, an oxygen rich environment uh, so that it would have access to oxygen. And then he would flood it with hydrogen uh, such that the brain cell would start to go through this process of trying to save itself from dying but killing itself in the process. And then he would flood it with some somewhere between liquid and uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, gaseous hydrogen, but around about the four Kelvin mark. It's basically the coldest thing we can make um, without like magnetic spin cooling and right. and the cooling and stuff like that. Um, and so he had a cryogenic cooler, and it, it was a 250 watt cryogenic cooler. And and he'd run this experiment a number of times. And outside of the window, there's the Paolo Siena. It's like a load of horses going around on bareback and. <laughs> And so on, but he's interested <laughs> in the experiment. Uh, and suddenly, uh, it started boiling the the 250 uh, watts of cryogenic cooling, and it, there was no electricity attached at this point, and it continues to do it. Continued to do huh. it. What the hell is going on? There's a itty bitty bit of nickel in there. There's a brain cell, and and this is boiling liquid. Yeah, not very cool. not what he was <laughs> even working on. <laughs> it's not. Yeah, what? yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. 
and, and so that, from 1989 to the current day, has been the mystery that he, he had to solve. That's funny. So, but it happened around the same time as... as well, uh, well, Fleischmann and Pons came before. And, it, it, and Fleischmann and Pons weren't only working on what was called by the press cold fusion. Right. They, they were working on other things to do with condensed ma- matter. Right. Uh, battery, uh, battery systems. I mean, that's pretty much right. I mean, superconductivity, right. gravity, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. There's an there's a interview, I think, in 1994 uh, in Infinite Energy where uh, uh, some interesting things are said. And it's the only point in the three page interview where clearly something that was said in the interview was edited out. Huh. Uh, and it was when talking about these four different things that they were actually researching at the same time as Lena. And, and their, their moment for, for, for Pons and Fleischmann wasn't really we produced a, a spike of excess heat. In my view, it was what some people call the Fleischmann singularity. And they had a one cc piece of uh, um, palladium. And they were uh, loading it for something like two or three weeks uh, with deuter- deuterium oxide enriched, probably with lithium in, in, in the electrolyte and so forth. And, and nothing seemed to be happening. So that I think they asked one of the, the uh, siblings, uh, or children rather, to go, to go in to just turn the power down. Now, what happens when you turn the electrostatic pressure down, the, the, uh, in my understanding, is, is that the gas that's in there may start to kind of come out. Right. And that, that causes hydrogen embrittlement, and then you get cracks forming. And this, right. This sends you through a sequence of events. Anyway, whatever was going on, what was what was found the Monday morning when they walked in was that the glass in the in the apparatus had basically disappeared. There was a hole in the the, the fume cupboard gone through the mic for mica or whatever it is and the the wood or whatever that was that the that the uh, um, a fume cupboard base was made from. You know, if it's in a chemistry lab, these tend to be like PTFE or something right. like that, but. Um, uh, it could have been stainless steel, I don't know. But it went through that base of the, of the fume cupboard and then it went into the concrete and it bored a hole out of the concrete. And in the air, there was this like suspension Smoke. of incredibly fine particles. Yeah. Like, you know. Something I've witnessed personally, actually. <laughs> so, really? yes, yeah, I, I did an experiment once that um, it, was pretty, it was pretty intense. And uh, my whole family was like, what the, what the hell just, what the hell did you just do? And I'm like, uh, I don't. I don't know. I think I know what I did, but I don't know if it exactly it, it, it involved carbon and it involved aqueous cell. Uh, however, it, it did me- it did melt the quartz that was in it. It does have a little okay. metal quartz. I mean, a little where the nickel actually um, it turned into a little spherical object and and melted into the quartz tube I was using at the time. Okay. And uh, it quickly boiled off all the water, and there was a fine mist that smelled like. Uh, it was almost sul- like sulfur, like brimstone. It was very, very interesting. So, um, well, I mean, it's the, the sulfur, as you're aware, is a standard George Osawar reaction. It's oxygen 16 and oxygen 16. It's re- reported as the smell that when you get a ball lightning blow up, uh, huh. you, you get this smell of, uh, of sulfur. Of sulfur. Oh, that would explain and, it. I would explain it. And, and so we actually took a 10 yen coin uh, at the end of the uh, series of experiments that we did all live, uh, unbroken, continuous, that's published on YouTube. And it was one of the last experiments. And, it, and the 10 yen coin is made of a, a very small amount of tin, like 2 to 3% of tin. It's made of copper and it's got some uh, zinc in there. And uh, the Amasa gas, which is the gas that's produced by this vibration plate going through uh, some electrolysis plates um, in a particular setup, the Amasa gas was exposed onto this uh, for just a second or a second and a half. And um, Amaz- Brown's gas, uh, uh, there's a guy called Slo- Stoyan, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Slobodan Stankovic in, in uh, Switzerland. And he's actually sh- shown that in his uh, Brown's gas, he has a lot of OH radicals. He's not the only person that has seen something along these lines. There is a, a guy called uh, Moldovani or something that did some uh, research in the early, about the uh, last uh, nine years ago, and he found that in his electrolysis cells, it, it, they were becoming, uh, you know, I think it's more alkaline, that he was turning his fingers to soap. So yeah. actually OH radicals being generated. Now, OH is one of the uh, uh, radicals, or one of the la- uh, most common interstellar gases. And they can self-maze. Now, if you can imagine, 
you have gas coming out here, you have a plasma excitation of the gas, and it's got a lot of OH radicals in there, you end up with a maser because it's reflecting off the coin back to the source and you've got a pl plasma reflector, just yeah. like I was talking about the, the latest research. Right. And before this call, I said, you know, they, they've got this research where they've created these lasers that have incredible intensity because I, they are reflecting off a plasma right. mirror. Right. Well, you've got the end of the plasma from from the burning OH yeah, from the burn, burning um, Mars yeah. gas. Then you've got the coin, which is copper, which is reflecting back. Could you have what it naturally self mazes OH radicals? Right. Could you have a maser? Because when you actually look at the coin, it's like it's cut through with a laser. Right. It's like cut. There's nothing on this side. It's not even melted. And this side, it's like a hole through it. But on the periphery of that, there were some different structures. One that looked exactly like a, 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 a Matsumoto ring uh, of what what he would call, a, 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 eventually call it an exotic vacuum object. But that's okay. to yeah. the side. There was another thing which was a pit, and it looked like it had some little cobblestones in there. And looking, zooming into those one of those cobblestones, in fact, you could see it quite clearly at a much higher, magni a lower magnification level. But zooming into one of the cobblestones, it had what looked like snowballs running around in snow, like starting small, like you're, you're growing right. a, a snowball to make a snowman. Like little snowman, little you know? um, plasma little plasma balls, basically. Well, running around. <laughs> Physical objects that have, they've started off small. You can see they're small because there's there's no ball at the start of the channel, and then as it's gone round and it's wound its way round on the top of this cobblestone, it's got bigger and bigger. So the channels got bigger, and the balls got bigger, and then for some, whatever reason it died, and it left the ball which is rich in sulfur, and there's no sulfur, not in the gas, not not in, huh. in the coin. I didn't know that. So, so that that. That's interesting. And the rest of the surface is it, the stuff that looks like snow is copper oxide. So you actually have the oxygen fusing into sulfur, same hmm. as the ossuary. So this is one of the morphological and spatial uh, pieces of evidence which become extremely strong for saying, look, you, you, you might say this is contamination, but it's really, uh, you would have to go through ridiculous levels of mental gymnastics right. to say that some contamination got in there and it dug out these channels of the oxide on the copper and ended up with a sphere that's got sulfur in it. I right, mean, that's really interesting, it, yeah. Oh my well, God. And, and that's really exciting. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, I just got a, um, a lab space, so I'm gonna start carrying out these. I stopped doing the experiments because I was actually doing, I did that particular one in my living room. And after that, I was kind of like, uh, I should probably get some, you know, it's just uh, safety concerns with my family and stuff. So. Well, uh, Pons and Fleischmann never repl replicated their singularity. They were so afraid of it. And, 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 and uh, Piantelli went small scale and careful for the rest of his research because you, you have to let, respect this thing. Yeah. You have to respect it. And I don't have the proper, the proper sensors. I, at the moment actually if you see up on the top i have a little uh funding thing for a uh, radiation detector you know it's like a hundred bucks but, but right. um, yeah but but why i say exciting though is if i if i do this experiment and carry it out uh would it be okay if i sent you a sample that you could that you can analyze you would love that okay yeah. as long as you're open uh uh we're willing to support up to a certain level but if people want a lot of samples then we're still oh, no. willing to do it but you would, you would have to talk to one of my colleagues at Alan Goldwater okay. to uh, because there is cost involved. There's not just yeah. labor. There's, there, there's oh I know there's, I've looked into it quite a bit. Like um you know I've I've looked uh, talked with some people at uh, OSU uh, Oregon State University and stuff like that and I realize <laughs> it's not a not a cheap process at all. I mean so. if there's nothing if there's nothing there then you saved yourself a bunch of money. If if there's something there then you can maybe go and have it done at a, another institution that's going to say, "Oh, how did you do this?" <laughs> right. Yeah, so I know I, I I'll get everything written out and uh, so uh, it can be replicatable and all that kind of stuff, but it um but yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there cuz I we uh, this is the first time I think we've formally talked, you know. Yeah. Face, face so, to face. So, so the, the other the other thing was is uh, based on this, it's trying to pack it into a small box, right? And that things want to fission, and that there is a very large theory. I'm translating a book 
uh, by a guy called Alexander Parkhamov. Right. And this guy has studied neutrino physics since the, uh, the uh, late 1980s. And how's the funding gone on that? Like, did, uh, have you raised well, your money? That's, that's, that's all sorted. Good, uh, good. The book is, is uh, I think, 40,000 out of 60,000 words are translated. I wanted good. to get it done by the end of September. It's going to go into October. But uh, the, the point is we've had so much to do that was unexpected. We didn't expect to go and, and, and look at Amaza. We didn't expect to, to, to uh, look at uh, uh, I didn't expect to present to ICCF and do two posters and stuff. I didn't expect to go and speak at Madison University. So uh, there's a lot, lot happened in between, but all of these things are good. Uh, uh, we had an opportunity because of the way things worked out to analyze the parts of the inside of the reactor from uh, Alexander Parkhamov. And we found that it would appear that he synthesized lead, which is quite common in, in a uh, high uh, very well performing low energy nuclear reactions uh, uh, systems, they will synthesize some lead and typically they also synthesize some tin. Now, if you look at the crustal abundance of, of, of tin and lead, they are quite high. In fact, they're often found uh, in, in, together to a certain degree. Right. But in the case of lead, uh, Adamenko, uh, a Ukrainian uh, uh, working out of uh, the old Soviet uh, isotopic laboratory outside of Kiev, he was able to uh, um, uh, uh, synthesize lead very, very regularly from samples that basically didn't have lead in them. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, Leclerc, he synthesized lead. In the case of, it would seem, with uh, the, the Indian that very, I worked with. Uh, very well documented, too. Right? Yeah, very well. Like 700-page book yeah. you can go out and buy now on Google Play or you can buy from Amazon. It's not cheap, but it's well worth a read. And so um, he... he uh, um, uh, uh, Suhas Ralkai in India, he would appear to have synthesized lead. Uh, uh, Alexander Parkhamov had synthesized lead in previous reactors. He didn't know until we looked at the core, uh, some core sample from his 225 day reactor that he'd synthesized lead. He'd also synthesized tin as well and abundant amounts of calcium. And it's very interesting. Uh, if you look at the, 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 I think the top three elements are like in the crust are like oxygen, uh, uh, um, silicon, uh, uh, aluminium, calcium. And, and so, or it's, it's certainly in the, the very top few. I'll, I'll bring up some data on that. Uh, let, let me pull that up in the background to make sure I'm not- I, I'm on important. it, I'm on it. Top elements in the crust of, in the universe, or should I say in the crust no, of- No, no, in the Earth's crust. I'll just have a look to see what questions are there. All right, and here we'll switch to this, make it easier to see. And good old Google. So oxygen forty six point six, uh, silicon twenty silicon twenty seven point seven, uh, al aluminum or aluminium as you say across the pond eight point one, <laughs> uh, iron is five percent, and we can go in deeper if we'd like. Yeah. I think calcium's pretty high up on that list as Aluminum, well. Aluminum, iron, here we go, here's a better. Yep, calcium is right after iron, number five, sodium yeah, six, yeah, yeah, okay. uh, potassium seven, magnesium's eight, titanium nine, hydrogen 10. So when building this calculator that we built over the last couple of years, starting with the work of Alexander Parkhamov, we, we, we built onto it an understanding of uh, you know, things are trying to go into a small box, but we also need to consider uh, uh, what the most common elements and even the common element isotopes are. So th there's going to be a couple of updates of the, the Lena reaction calculator where we are not only, and <laughs> actually the programmer doesn't even know this now. So <laughs> if he finds out about this, he'll find out what I've got coming down the pipe for him. But essentially, it's not just the the, uh, the abundance of the elements, but it's also the abundance of the element isotopes relative to other isotopes. What that is telling you, yeah, well, what that is telling you, is that in four and a half billion years of experiments with lightning, plasma pinches hitting the Earth, you are synthesizing these elements because all that Adamenko was doing was taking a electrode which was flat cylindrical. And it was in a cup, like a cup was put over the top of like alumina, which is a high uh, uh, breakdown voltage dielectric. And then he had a little sample of whatever metal he was testing. And he had a 300 joule capacitor bank that he discharged into this target. Right. And the target would then synthesize all of the periodic table elements and even synthesize elements that aren't even in our near universe and stable elements that or 
power, semi-stable elements. It would be a, like a condensed matter particle accelerator <laughs> in, in a way, yeah. right? <laughs> in a sense. Yeah, so, and, and, and this is quite easy to understand, that this is basically the same as a lightning discharge. Yeah. So my view is that you don't need to do four and a half billion years of experiments. You can just look at the crustal abundance. Right. Yeah. And you can see what, what's transpired, yeah. It, it's like, whatever happened, this was the result. <laughs> yeah. That's and uh, yeah. from electrical discharge. And that's so that's how I like to look at it too. In my in my own experiments and from the people I've learned from I mean so many people of the past, too many to even you know, I mean you've said quite a few names, uh, but um I, and it brings me into back into like the electric universe theory and also sapphire. Somebody brought up sapphire and you were talking about sapphire a little bit. What's what's your what's what do you think is the biggest challenge for uh the, the electric universe theory to be something of of a contender against the mainstream ideas like you think it what do you think is the block there why is there so much resistance to because it's not well, discrediting I, I sooner or later the electric universe theory is going to have to take on board neutrinos so uh, the, 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 basically you, you know there's this uh a simple atomic model i think it is a sam group and the, the, there's this french guy and this american guy that come over this great i can't remember it's like uh, but, but basically, they're saying that the nucleus on, only has electrons and, uh, and protons, and that an electron and a proton makes a neutron. Okay, and it, y y the clue is when a neutron comes out, it's got like a 15 second or whatever it is, uh, 15 minute, or it's 15 something <laughs> half life. <laughs> right, very short. Uh, it decays. Uh, but the idea is that it decays and it, and it releases a flavor of uh, uh, neutrino. Now, uh, there is some debate as to whether a neutrino is a major on a particle, which means it's only antiparticle. And Parkamov's uh, latest understanding from his neutrino understanding is, is that electrons at a high enough temperature and a high enough density, i.e. when they're in condensed matter in the form of either liquids or solids, uh, and they're high enough temperature, they will synthesize uh, 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 ultra-low energy neutrinos. And these are not the kind of neutrinos that are coming at, at like 100 trillion per right. s second. Would you say, uh, would you the sun? dare to say like they're like uh, like vacuum, vac uh, low, uh, what would it be, zero point vacuum fluctuations, like something along uh, those lines? I, not necessarily. I, I, Let, let's just stick to the fact that that, that they are. They were shown by Frederick Rains. That they were proposed by uh, uh, Wolfgang Pauli, I think, in 1920 something. That they were, and he apologised for for predicting a particle that they yeah. would never be discovered. Right. right. And then, then in, in I think 1954 or whatever, it was Frederick Rains and another character, but Frederick Rains got the Nobel Prize for it. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 through a, bit, a beta decay, they they established that there the, the was the, these uh, uh, neutrinos. That there was the mass difference and so on. Uh, and and so I think they they had a, a, a fission reactor and they would look at scint scintillation in in a water body or something like that. Anyway, you can go and look up the fact that Frederick Rains Nobel Prize blah blah blah. I'll tell you what what he did. But anyway, um, uh, it, it, essentially, uh, neutrinos are effectively stable in this in this form. Uh, and neutrinos can exchange energy with electrons. So you can have a neutrino and an electron on one side of the equation, and a neutrino and an electron on the other side of the equation, and they can just shift their energy around, which means they have a physical interaction. So we, we, we know they have a physical interaction. What Parkmore was saying that is the actual uh, en massively energetic and highly dense electrons, where they smack together, synthesize a, a, a neutrino, which as I've said, it may be a major ion particle, so it could flip between being a, an, an anti-neutrino and right. a neutrino, which means it can do all kinds of nuclear reactions. But what, what's interesting about Lena is unless you push it too far, in the case of Adaminko and Leclerc, uh, uh, you, you, you basically take stable or radioactive elements and you end up with stable elements. And that's the basis behind uh, my interest in, in, in exploring the science before we get to make, making real use of it, mm, right. uh, is, is to deal with the mess of, of, of how it's <laughs> happening, the theory. Well, yeah, and so what do you think is the, the, the greatest challenge for exp explaining or yeah, you know, the so, so I think acceptance. The is they're, they're not talking about neutrinos. They're only talking about electrons. Now, I I electrons do flood into the the, the, the sun uh, uh, you know alpha waves and 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 so on yeah uh, they, they they they've looked at these things uh, and the, the work of uh, um bostic the the, the 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 plasmoids and so forth and uh, uh these these things that they, they are real and and so 
but what Alexander Parkhamov is saying is that the the that you also have, as well as electricity going into these bodies, you also have uh, uh, neutrinos, because neutrinos are affected by two things, or interact with two things, the, the, the weak force and gravity. Whatever gravity is. Right. <laughs> now, the electric universe might have a different view on that, but That's, whatever's yeah. causing that, it, they're being pulled in. Uh, and and so if you've got a very large flux of relic neutrinos, I'm not talking about the relativistic ones. I'm talking about ones that have non-zero mass. Okay. And, and and by the way, if you're so not virtual right, particles, so to speak, like uh, they're, yeah. they're real particles. Right. Fact, right. The, 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 the particles he's talking about are supposedly uh, uh, they're about two Kelvin, and they are left over from the birth of the universe. If if we accept that that occurred, now the electric universe may have a different view on that. Uh, but if you're saying that the electrons at high temperature can can come together and synthesize the equivalent of relic neutrinos, uh, then then the relic neutrinos that we observe might be relics, but only from other celestial bodies, <laughs> temperature yeah. events yeah. Right. of electrons colliding together. You know, right. so what is relic? What does relic actually mean? Right. Is it is it, we're only getting light from that far distance away because our solar system was only born in a certain point of time? So I, I don't know. But, right. You know, <laughs> that's yeah. That's going deep into the the theory and the debate of yeah cosmology. The, the, the if th that's the point is that, that if we have protons electrons and neutrinos that's it right now you know some people argue that quarks they're not a real thing <laughs> i could see their um, i could see their argument you know it's when when the only way we discover them is by smashing particles together like are we really influencing influencing them into existence are, by are you just seeing a vibration on on the structure of the physical vacuum yeah that as a new particle yeah, you know, that's I, that's the question. Like, that's kind of yeah, exactly. Like, it's very very, and especially with like LIGO experiments too. It's the same principle. Like, when you have th this laser and you're trying to find a vibration that is so absolutely minuscule, like it's like uh, it's like going to absolute zero. You're always going to be influenced by some, you know, some type of energy radiating from the cosmos. Well, you're you know, going to be interested in noise. And, and this is the, the point of, uh, of the work uh, of, since 1998, sorry, 1988 of Alexander Parkhamov that's in his book, uh, Space, Earth, Human, uh, where he's actually looking at random processes and the random processes are influenced by something that's common in the cosmos through the Earth right. and, and in all biology. And... It would appear, and there's a guy called Simon Schnoll, and he's done a study of over 100 papers from 1954 up to the, nearly the present day, and it's publicly available. You can go and look for it, Simon Schnoll, and look at whatever it is, but you'll find it. Um, and and they, they're basically concluding that it is the neutrino flux that does these things. And in fact, Alexander Parkhamov in his body, book, he, he describes not only can he lens relic neutrinos uh, that are in the wavelength, wavelength scale of, of microns to millimeters with a metal parabolic dish, the sort you have for looking at your satellite mm -hmm. programs, uh, into a beta isotope like strontium-90 uh, uh, and then uh, look for higher beta emissions to discriminate preferentially. He has this apparatus, he's done 20 years of experiment. Every time we're closer to the sun, the Earth is closer to the sun, the solid angle of... Uh, 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 neutrinos from the sun doesn't change when we're closer to the sun in any real sense but what does change is the gravitational lensing of relic neutrinos or let's say ultra low energy neutrinos that are coming in from the cosmos so you get an increased flux of those yeah. and you get an increase in the rate of decay of beta isotopes that's very very or interesting beta. yeah that so this is the back premise of a book but also for detecting those things he looks at mosfet uh, uh, yeah. uh, semiconductor devices yep. Now, of course, semiconductor devices, you need tunneling, you need a kind of Cooper pairing type yep. event to go on, and so on. What causes these things to occur? Well, he actually uses it to detect neutrino flux. That's, <laughs> so, yeah. So a random process could actually just be a burst of neutrinos that came from a celestial event. Are we actually looking at a gravity wave, or are we looking at a, 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 a neutrino flux? Right. Variation. Now, here's the really interesting thing. Two years after, two years after Frederick Raines established that neutrinos were a real thing, at least on a, you could see it on a phenomenological basis, there was a Japanese scientist, I forget his name, he's a nuclear scientist, and he suggested that neutrinos could explain gravity. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I know who you're talking about. A guy called Bob McGrath, I think he's from CERN 
theory group. And I think in 2010 or 2012, he published a paper that's saying relic neutrinos explain all the observables of gravity. Hmm. So what I'm saying is that the neutrino flux could be new gravity. Hmm. Yeah, that's it certainly makes uh, logical sense. Now, now we just need to carry out the experiments to to test it. Right. That's, that's the point of science. Right? Well, let's speak. And so when I send these papers to Alexander Parker, well, it's really interesting that people in the West are finally catching up to what right. they theory in the 1970s right. already experimentally proven. Well, I think it's just um, I, I noticed that uh, Russia is a lot more open to fringe sciences and, and in particular plasma light, plasma ball lightning. And it's really it's really interesting that we're, it seems like we're just now catching up. Like as far as mainstream but I, I, goes. I don't know whether it's, you know, the, there's, there's different people that know different things. Oh, yeah. So you, you mentioned Sapphire. Now, there's a guy called Hal Putoff who might be involved with Tom DeLong in supposedly releasing things about UFOs. Right. However, um, uh, Hal Putoff, uh, as I said, not, not only, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, was involved in that kind of area, he visited a guy, a guy in 1992, just after the fall of the Soviet Union in Russia, uh, uh, called Alexander Chinetsky. And Alexander Chinetsky had developed this tube, which had, I believe, a high frequency electrical discharge. And effectively, it was a one sided sapphire reactor. You had a spherical anode, you had a flat electrode down this end, and you had uh, uh, um, double layers, which are just a thing. You know, they, were, they existed a long time before sapphire. Uh, and in that device, he was able to create massive over unity. He p claims that there was some level of propulsion going on. And he also claims that it was emitting waves that were able to change the, be the, re the decay rate of radioactive Ooh. isotopes. You just, said a, okay? you just said a very taboo word there, too. <laughs> very ta What's that? The, the over unity, the over unity word. <laughs> like, well, well, I'm just saying what uh, Hal Putoff observed. Right. He, he saw the device, he met the, the scientist, and he tried to get him to America, just right. like he brought Yuri Geller to America, and just just like he ran the psychic spy program, and, right. and, and just like he, uh, who else did he, he brought a guy that I work with quite a lot, and then, called so, Dr. Ojibwe. And that's, and that's kind of a, a tricky balance, too, because and um, like the entertainment value and the entertainment side of things... Uh, can sometimes mask a lot of the scientific endeavors, it seems like, to make it so oh, it oh, puts oh, people oh, off. You are so on the money. Sir. Yeah. What I have here is a few samples. This one here. Yeah, and that, that's who was in my mind, but I didn't want to, I don't, I didn't want to just say here. his name, but yeah, yeah. This one here. Hutchinson is a, is a wonderful example. So th this is a piece of steel from 1986, uh, and in Hutchinson's lab in Canada, uh, it was exposed to a, uh, a Tesla coil at 15 feet, uh, a discharge uh, as part of the spark gap in the, in the, the, the uh, Tesla coil. And he had various interactive ra ra interacting radio frequencies in, in a kind of like reflective aluminium setup. And it, you have, it would appear, synthesized elements in these uh, pits. Uh, and you have very specific structures, and you even have uh, a yin yang here. And I've shared photos of macro uh, and microscopy and SEM photos. This was an aluminium piece of bar. This was from 2007. And uh, we've shared a lot of data about this. I've discussed some data about the study that was done at Synthes Tech in, in uh, Russia, in Sochi. Uh, and they tested this. I'm going to publish that data soon. But essentially, what they found this was an, a straight aluminium bar. And uh, it was put on a piece of plastic. You, you want it on an insulator because these things apparently uh, act a bit like electrons and they can bleed into other metals and they can infect other, other metals. But it started to twist. It started to bend. It wasn't hot. And it went this coral kind of look here with pieces missing from it. And if you actually look, it's quite dense inside. Um, and it actually doesn't sound. I don't know if you can hear this. It's much higher ring. It's not the dead sound of aluminium anymore. And if you actually look into these pits, there are uh, uh, elements in there that were not in uh, the uh, original material or shouldn't have been. But more interestingly enough, there is 
nickel and there is lead. Now, we've already discussed that this system, if it's pushed hard, will always synthesize lead. Why? Because it's the heaviest stable element. OK, if you go beyond there, you get to bismuth, which is technically unstable right. with a scary long half-life of mul many multiples of the, the length of the supposed birth of the universe. But anyway, um, if it, it, lead is the last technically stable element. And so if you've got lighter elements, it will fission between lead and the others, and, and, and little pockets of that will push all the way to lead. It may push beyond lead, but if, if it settles down in the right way, it'll always end up chucking out a load of lead. Right. And this is seemingly the way the system works. But the interesting thing, and what I realized from looking at this and other Lenin researchers, is P and Telly found a way around the it destroys the reactor problem because the pro, it kicks out protons. Why does it kick out protons? Well. If you look at the exchange reactions on our uh, reaction calculator, very often it's ben energetically beneficial when you have two nucleons to start with at the beginning and you have two nucleons at the end to kick out a proton. Secondly, if you're trying to synthesize elements that are heavier than calcium-40, you're going to need extra protons to stabilize the nuclei. So extra neutrons to stabilize the nuclei, which means you have an imbalance of protons. So right. you have to kick out the proton. Right. But what's more interesting is that the proton is a fermion. And a fermion can't exist in a very small space with a lot of other fermions. So it's like, you're not welcome around here. Get out. You're kind of uh, upset in the party. OK, um, all of the other bosons can live. And, and two thirds or something of the elements are bosons or the element isotopes. So there's a preferential preferentially nature is telling you it wants to synthesize bosons. OK, now, the other thing is it's kicking out fermion. The other thing that's been established in Lena by a guy that worked at Los Alamos National Laboratory and kind of managed like eight bombs and stuff, this guy called Tom Clater, <laughs> he established that in corona discharges, a form of uh, uh, low energy nuclear reactions that's done by a guy called uh, Correa Brothers and other people have done this. They, they actually use uh, corona discharge to treat water that they feed to seeds to, to make them grow faster in, in Germany, uh, which has been studied with a team in Russia as well. Hmm. Uh, that was a presentation at Sochi last year. But um, anyway, the, the, uh, the uh, lead and nickel that's synthesized in here is, in the case of the nickel, there are... Sorry, I, I need to finish the Tom Clater bit. Tom Clater <laughs> established that tritium is synthesized in Lena, ah, repeated, okay. right? And this is what from is the corona discharges? Yeah, Okay. and from other systems. So is, it similar, is it similar to, like in a vacuum, is it sim similar to the Sapphire project? They're not saying it's tritium, and it could be HD, and it could be 3H. So, you know, they're not calling what it is. Okay. But if it is tritium, they don't want to discuss that because there's implications. <laughs> then there's, right. it goes, not, it's not what they want to experiment on. They're going another, they're trying to go prove anyway, another thing. <laughs> yeah, okay. Sorry. The, the, the point is, is that tritium has been established in, in uh, corona or glow discharges, which effectively is one aspect of what Sapphire is doing. Right. And, and, and as, as I said, Sapphire is basically a, a, a very large double-sided version of, of the Chinetsky reactor um, from, I think it was 1970s. And by the way, just like Tesla, Chinetsky blew up a big power station when he was running his little device. So there's Oops. an interesting thing going on there. So, so the, the point is, is that, that, that tritium is also a fermion. And so the first and, second, uh, first and third fermions, the two fermions in, in the, you know, I, the distribution that you get in, in element uh, isotopes, uh, those two fermions are kicked out and are left in the Lena ash, you know. But half the time, if you're putting hydrogen in the system, you're never going to observe hydrogen, are you? Because it's like, well, it was there before. <laughs> yeah. You're going to observe tritium. Now, the point is, is that if you go and look at Piantelli's patent, he's got a round that it's eating the reactor by using these kinetically ejected protons to interact with... Uh, um, uh, what do you call it, with uh, um, uh, other elements like seven lithium go to eight beryllium and decay into two four helium, uh, or uh, with uh, 11 uh, boron and, and making 12 carbon. So he's getting around that process uh, uh, by using one, one as like a, a solid state particle accelerator and, and the other one as a receiver. So, so that, that, that's what, what I'm talking about there. Now, what, what is unique and interesting about what I, uh, the uh, synthesis tech, when they analyzed this, and without any understanding that I had, they were just analyzing it, you know, cold, cold. They didn't know what to expect. The nickel has a number of isotopes. It has 58, 60, 61, 62, and 64, right? Right. Guess which one 
was anomalous. Mm, okay. 64? No, no, no. 61. Yeah. Why? It's uh, the only ionic isotope. Okay. So it's synthesized it, but it had 3.7 times the, the ratio. Oh, I see. Massively, like 370%. Yeah. Huge. And more interestingly, it's in the middle of the isotopes, 58, 60, 61, 62, 64, yeah. right? So it, you can't have this kind of like, well, you got some contamination on there and there was some fractionation and you lost the 64 or you lost the 58. No, it's right in the middle of the isotopes. Right. Okay. Bal so, balanced. Uh, What's the most uh, abundant isotope? Wait, Wait, the okay. lead is 204, 206, 207, 208, okay? okay? Which was the isotope that was con more concentrated? Uh, 206? No, 207. 207 no. is the fermionic <laughs> isotope, the only fermionic oh, okay, isotope. Okay, okay. See, I don't know. I don't know what, right. the, fermionic, what the fermionic isotopes and, and those are. And whilst we're talking about this, the ARV supposedly uses 199 mercury. 199 mercury is one of the only two isotopes uh, or, of mercury that is a fermion. That's one reason why you would use it, because it doesn't go into the exotic vacuum object. It can build an exotic vacuum object, but it can't, sorry, the exotic vacuum objects can't live inside the mercury. So it doesn't it's keep on assembling itself and eat itself, preferentially. Um, and, and by keeping it real and just using that single isotope of mercury, uh, you actually can have energetic outcomes, but the most likely energetic outcome is to produce two other isotopes of mercury. So it's very, very good if you want to create an anti-gravity vehicle to use that specific, <laughs> specific isotope of, of, of mercury. And I, th that's one reason. The other reason is, and I've been saying this since 2017, beginning of 2017, you need... Uh, uh, conductivity is very important. So aluminium is really incredibly affected because one, it's got low melting point, i.e. the electron lattice bonds uh, electrically can't hold together very well. And what seems to be the active agent is able to rip them apart and do jelly things like you saw here with it about being right. off. But the other thing is, is uh, uh, the conductivity is, is how much free electrons there are in the material. Aluminium is the fourth most uh, conductive element. But there's also a thing called electron affinity. And that is how much the atom wants to take on board an electron. Well, the most, uh, the, the, the element on the periodic table that's a conductor that wants to take on electrons more than any other element in the periodic table is gold. And yeah. it's a single isotope, 197, okay? The element, one of the elements that absolutely doesn't want to take on an electron at all is mercury, right? So that means if you have an EVO, an exotic vacuum object, whose ions are made, it's synthesized by uh, um, uh, mercury uh, ions, Okay, it's lost an electron, it's made an ion, it goes into the exotic vacuum object. The exotic vacuum object, according to a person called Shoulders, and I'm building up to something here, uh, a guy called Shoulders, uh, uh, he used mercury preferentially. And it, the, that, he says that, that an exotic vacuum object can have uh, 10 to the 23 electrons in it. And for every 100,000 electrons, it can have an ion in it. And the iron, in his case, and in the one I'm talking about here, could be mercury. And if mercury is in there, it's a frigging heavy nuclei. You've got for every ten to the, every hundred thousand electrons, uh, I like ten to the five out of every ten to the. So you've got ten to the twenty-three electrons in one evo, and then you've got for every ten to the fifth uh, 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 one is 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 a an ion of mercury. And it shields its mass and inertia, which means you can have an unimaginable, unimaginable number amount of mass in one Evo. But the whole thing, according to Shoulders, can act like an electron. And if the electron wants to go into something else, like a mercury atom, and replace one of its electrons, well, that, that's a problem because the, the mercury atom says, no, nope, not interested at all. A gold atom would go, come on, bring it on. Right. So, more than any other conductive element. And it's the third or fourth most conductive element. So it really wants to do that. So right. gold is key to storing this energy. But uh, mercury is key to, like, putting and, and doing, like, it, it's, it's the one that you would want to use for anti-gravity effects. Okay. 
And so, you know, I, I've said one, once I've dealt with the, the mystery of Leonard, I want to deal with anti-gravity. <laughs> and so I didn't expect the two things to be linked. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, well, I mean, you need a power source first, right? You got to have a power source before you can be able to transverse vast distances. Yeah, so yeah. anyway, so the, the point, point being is it's incredibly difficult to have transmutation going on, right? Because a lot of the physics community will say it's impossible. Right. Secondly, you've got multiple transmutations. Thirdly, you've got multiple transmutations that are very common in Lena. Right. Fourthly, you've got isotopic anomalies. Fifthly, it's isotopic anomalies that are massive and they're only for the fermionic isotopes, which we already know Lena likes to spit out protons and it likes to spit out tritons. Right. Okay. So 100% certainly that without a shadow of a doubt, Hutchison was transmuting elements. 100% certain. This one sample tells you all you need to know. And it is only scratching the surface of what these samples can reveal. Scratching the surface. Right. For um... Now, he discovered this in 1979. What was he doing? He was working on uh, decommissioning military equipment, and he was getting all kinds of radio transmitters with frequencies you're not allowed to have. Right. Okay? So you're not allowed. You, you, the chances of Joe Bloggs or, or, or Joe Sixpack ever, ever discovering this are zero to, to much less than zero. Right? Then, then he was a Tesla enthusiast. Right. Okay? I can, re I can so relate. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he would build very large Tesla coils and see what would he, he could do with them. Right. Well, one day he's messing around with these things, interacting this with that, and he got hit in the back of the head with a lump of metal. <laughs> well, that's not usual. There's no one else in the room, and I don't believe there's any poltergeists there. So he kind of like started questioning things. Okay. <laughs> and so he went on to show that he could effectively teleport material, which Shoulders also did. He, he what one of the Philadelphia project kind of touches on that well, stuff. You know, is that real? I don't know. But what we what he did was teleport material, it right. would seem. And, and uh, you know, it would appear that other researchers that we work with are teleporting small amounts of material uh, from inside their reactor to out of their reactor. And, 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 and the Russian, Russians like Alexander Shishkin have shown that they can take uh, these exotic vacuum objects, they can make them into a, a neutral version, and they can go through a gas or another medium. And the medium, even if it's a metal, it will take on the nuclei of that medium. And they can, uh, they have characterized that it will leave pits in an X-ray uh, 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 celluloid that are the width and the uh, diameter that are parameterized to a factor of the atom that they took on board when they passed through that material. So there's no doubt that this can teleport material. OK, so he was teleporting material. He was also making metals go transparent. He was also intersecting materials of different uh, types. Well, you can do that if it's temperature isn't a thing. If, if you're dealing at a, a level which isn't like electrostatic repulsion, you know. And, and so everyone in the world yeah. wanted to get and, and understand what, what John was doing. And I can tell you, anyone that got a sample of his material from 1979 onwards, will have known 100% certainty, if they were competent and they were able to have an active mind and could look at things critically, they will have known that you could transmute elements in a cold environment without even touching it through non-physical connection. They will have known that. So any of these people that analyzed these things would have known that. Now, you only have a phone. You're only able to watch this on a computer because of a guy called Kenneth Shoulders, Kenneth Radford Shoulders. He invented the mass spectrometer, the same kind of technology, the quadrupole mass spectrometer. This was tested on an octopole mass spectrometer in Russia. But he invented this technology to determine what masses were in elements. Right. That was one of the things he invented. But yeah. he also is credited as the father of microelectronics because he invented the screening technology to be able to develop and screen and, 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 and expose uh, to make you know, semiconductors and so forth. So we're only able to look at this because of Kenneth Shoulders. Well... In 1979, some people were looking at these samples, and I believe that some people thought, this, we need to bring in some serious guns to look at this. And when you're looking at all the people that are available in 1979, 
the person that would have been top of your list is a guy called Kenneth Shoulders because he knows about plasma, he knows about atoms, he knows about electrons. He, he's an absolute genius when it comes to building experiments, uh, you know, and, and, and coming down to the nitty gritty of how things work. And did he, just well, to break in real quick, did he have any um, formal education? Was he like, did he have a doctorate? Anything in? No. Yeah, I, I find that really fascinating, but okay, go on. And he rejected it. So yeah, I, yeah, Hutchison. yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> These are free thinkers. They haven't become Agent Smiths yet. You know? Yeah, that's, so they're, they're yeah. able to use, they're able to look with their eyes. And one thing that I learned from uh, reading about Kenny Shoulders, because I unfortunately only came really across him after he died, was he said, uh, people don't, uh, people just don't look for things. Uh, you know, if you don't look, you won't even know what you didn't find. <laughs> I think it's like Aristotle says, I think it was Aristotle or one of the ancient Stoics said, like, you know, the co most common problem most people have is they just don't use their brain. Like, they just don't, you know what I mean? They don't critically think, they just accept. So. The, they don't believe their lying eyes. Right. They, they, they look at something and whatever it is, however surprising it is, to keep their own spatial worldview, they, they put it into a box that is consistent with what they already know right it's comfortable and, and, they don't step outside their comfort zone yeah and the other thing is when they when they look at something and there's something there they they literally cannot see the wood for the trees you know they, they can't see beyond uh, oh that's just contamination they can't see that the contamination is in a particular form repeatedly across multiple experiments they can't see it right they, and personally they're not even probably looking right the most, the most it's of the problem, dismissed they're not looking. yeah it's dismissed the Bible says, seek and thou shalt find. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you have to look to find. You can't find if you don't look. Right. It's just not possible. And, and the and best so, person that, and the best uh, creature, I guess, to ask is nature. That, that I believe <laughs> that could have been brought to the table to work out what John Hutchison had, had come across. That's Ken, Ken Shoulders. Was Ken Shoulders. That's the, the, that was the person at the top of the tree, right? And he started work with, with uh, 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 as a basis point, uh, uh, looking at the samples, looking at the understanding, and also looking at the work of uh, Winston Bostick. And Winston Bostick, I believe, was tasked in the late 1950s, no, 1960s or whatever, 1970s, with, I believe, looking at some of the more energetic effects that, that Tesla was looking into. This is my supposition. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure I'm on, on the money. But anyway... Whatever he discovered, these things uh, called, oh, called condensed, which he named condensed plasmoids, and they seem to create the kind of things that are all out there in the cosmos, but just on a micro scale. Okay, just by creating a certain state of matter uh, that was named the condensed plasmoid. And so, Ken Shoulders started at that point, and he spent the rest of his life trying to explain this. So one of the brightest people on the planet, and in, 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 the, in the end, in an interview or, or a, a two-way conversation between him and John Hutchison, which we published in 2010, the only person he really respected in the whole planet was John Hutchison. And he's not even an accredited scientist with all of the labels after his name and just all of the publishing. But he's a hardcore experimenter and, pl and likes well, to play. Just, just someone actually having fun. Yeah, he likes to play. He likes to play. It's, it's not even that he was trained to do an experiment. It's like, right. what happens if I twiddle this knob? Right. I you think know? that's the beauty. Is that, and, and actually, he, because he has like that childlike approach to things, too, he's able to absorb a lot more than many others and observe things that a lot of people just would dismiss, like you said. He's unimaginably intuitive yeah. and absurdly honest. He's, he's literally pathologically honest. So, like, when, when, when people come to him, like, a, well, I don't know whether it was, he was in Canada or something, and the news crew wanted to come and film something. He says, look, I can't do anything unless you come in about one, two, three weeks or whatever. He says, well, we want to come tomorrow. Or it was, like, in two days. He says, well, I can't have it ready. So he put on a show for them where, you know, it wasn't all the way it should be. Now, a lot of people in, in, in the debunking community like to say, well, this isn't real because he did that. Well, John says, yes, I, I faked something. They wanted to see something, so I did it. Like, but I know I've done it. <laughs> it's interesting. It's, 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 you know what I'm saying? So He's so pathologically honest, even about ad ad admitting the fact that he did that. But people use that against him. It's like, come on. <laughs> 
but people pressured him into doing something he didn't want to do. He told them the honest truth. It couldn't be ready in this time. Right. So every, everything he's ever said to me, uh, uh, and that's been a lot, has, has been true. Uh, you know, so, so the, guy, the guy is pathologically honest. Now, you mentioned, and this is where I'm coming to, believe it or not, mm-hmm. you mentioned that people get confused between science fiction and, 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 and that, that something is possible because it's actually real, right? Right. Is that deliberate? I'll tell you what. In 1997, Ken Shoulders and John Hutchison, they spent one month with, like, Larry King, the, the producers uh, of blah, 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 and the producers of Star Trek. <laughs> one month to discuss what they should put in their science fiction shows that were going to be possible in the future using aspects of this technology. Hmm. Yeah. It isn't that there is confusion. It's, it's as I would call it, inoculation. It's coming down the pipe, my friends. It's coming down the pipe. And by the way, we probably already used it before as a species, but there's a whole completely different. That's a species. that's a deep, deep rabbit hole. That's a really deep. Yeah, rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there was one question that came up, and it has to do with uh, Amaza Gas. Uh, let's see, um, Slobodan. Sorry if I slaughtered your name, but he asked. Um, if you'll be trying to use tungsten boride with a masa gas, um, you know, because his, his thought process is um, tungsten and boride would would equate to gold. So, yes, and you can do that on our calculator and, and find out that that's the case. <laughs> right. So, yes, you're right. I mean, it's not like I haven't been blatantly obvious about where you can go with these things. If you can take elements and you can make them into other elements and that our, our online calculator correctly predicts all of the, the elements that were used by the alchemists, and it took me 50 seconds last year to demonstrate that the alchemists were using exactly the right elements that were available to them at the time, I also suggested that you can use the same calculator to to choose elements that would preferentially have an outcome. Right. And, and the, the other thing is that the boron is highly active, and I've specifically said why this is, uh, it, and it's the same reason that I chose indium. Boron, like lithium, like, bor- like indium, like gadolinium, and like ca- cadmium, all stop neutrons. What is a neutron? A neutron is a proton and electron bound together by, by a neutrino, because a neutrino comes out of it when it decays. What is actually a neutron? <laughs> is it just a, 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 what is stopping the neutron? Is it the, the, the fact that it has a relationship with a neutrino? Is it actually stopping neutrinos? Well, we know because Alexander Shishkin from Dubna, Science City, he has actually got a, neutrino, a, a, a string vortex photon, a condensed neutrino detector. And this is made using a standard boron-10, which is the isotope that has the high Barnes stoppage power of neutrons. Hmm. Um, He lowers the voltage from 1,000 volts to 570 volts, and he gets a signal that's something like 52 times bigger than a neutron when his string vortex uh, soliton generator uh, hits it. So effectively, the neutrinos uh, are coming in, and they're causing this uh, uh, interaction with boron. Boron in my view, is an excellent uh, material to mix with almost anything. And in fact, in the other room, from about two and a bit years ago, I have some boron trioxide that I meant to run in the Nova reactor uh, for precisely this reason. Uh, uh, and so, um, you know, so I took one other, a uh, couple of other elements to, to, to test with your Mars gas. Uh, one was indium. The reason is, is we already know that neutrinos from Alexander Parkamov's work, he's proved that neutrinos can uh, accelerate the decay of beta isotopes. Now, the uh, 87% or something of that order of indium-115, which is the neutron-stopping isotope of, of indium, uh, is 87%. It is a beta emitter. And uh, uh, that, that's two, a, a number of aspects. So the, these are the reasons that I took that. One, it's an extremely low melting point. Everyone testing HHO gases and, 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 and uh, uh, um, uh, you know, Brown's gas type right. things and oxyhydrogen gas, they were always trying to choose titanium and tungsten and fire brick and, because they were high in temperature so that it's spectacular that it can melt it. I wanted to go to the other end of the table and find something that wasn't going to burn in air readily 
uh, and that was an extremely low melting point, 152 or whatever it is degrees, 150 something degrees centigrade for indium. But more importantly, was a beta emitter, had a large proportion of beta isotope emission, and that it was a very long half-life. It's 30,000 times the life of the universe half-life. <laughs> That's why it's still 87% if we accept that there was a birth of the universe and not just the birth of the solar system, right, or the birth of the near universe. Right. Um, it's it's uh, 87% is a beta isotope. What does that do? If an EVO goes in, it causes the rapid decay from 30,000 times the length of the universe to a near instantaneous decay. It emits an electron. What does an electron do? Take the string vortex soliton, which is a an uh, 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 electron depleted exotic vacuum object, and it chucks electrons at it, which makes it into a non-electron de depleted uh, 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 exotic vacuum object, which can then massively transmute the elements because it's then fired up, it can suck in all that. Right, uh, it's a bla and black hole. Uh, indium. It's and redispersing. It's well, it's a black donut. <laughs> black donut. Well, I mean, technically, <laughs> a black <laughs> hole. Look what, at, are look what are we looking at? What are we looking at when we're looking at a black hole, right? But you're looking at nothing in the center, and you're looking at a fiery ring around the outside. <laughs> right. So it sounds like a black donut. To me. Yeah, it's black donut, right? <laughs> well, no, there's, there's, a, there's a white donut and a black donut, and you can call them a, a white hole or a black hole. Okay? Right. Right. So, well, actually, not a black hole. You call it a black plasmoid, and Pla the other one plasmoids. is a. But, but, but it's not really a plasmoid because it's not really got the electrons in there. Anyway, it, it, it shoulders calls them black and white evos, and so. At, if you if you saw a donut and it was glowing, then you could call that a white Evo, and, you, and one that you can't see, and it's still put, it's like a doing a something, black, black hole, right? It's sucking in material, so, right? That that would be a black Evo, right? right. It's just on a bigger scale, okay? So so in the case of the uh, uh, um, the black. Uh, Evo, it's like this neutrino condensate that, that Shishkin, but not only Shishkin, Bogdanovich's team at the Moscow Physical Laboratories. You have the people that discovered most of the element, heavy elements on Earth in the last 15 years or right. whatever at, at Dubna Science City and then built the, the Soviet nuclear weapons. They have established what it is, and also the Mos Moscow Physics Laboratory have independently observed the same phenomena. What the Mis Moscow Physics Laboratory did in work in 2007, they had an electric discharge through a water plas uh, a water jet, right. electrical discharges through it, very very similar to Suhas Ralkar's uh, foil generation system, and they found these donuts coming off. Sometimes they were white, but sometimes they were jet black. And behind them, you had a plasma discharge, but the light is not able to get through the black donut, yeah. which means it's stopping light. Right. It's, absor it's absorbing it, at least. Like it's, it's a black donut. Yeah. <laughs> it's eating those photons for breakfast. I would, I would love to see some experimental, like, video and, and yeah. And well, you go and see the pictures. It's public. Go to the MEHPL. Uh, uh, website and look up Bogdanovich or just look for Bogdanovich on our YouTube channel. You will see those links. But more recently, in May this year, he published work where they were continuing this work from, from the early 2000s. And they've created these things where they've observed these plasmoids moving around on the surface two days after the experiment. Hmm. And they're moving around, maybe transmuting the elements, but producing light. Right, as they and they move at like two microns per minute or something, and hmm. they, they're on the mic. They've got videos of these things moving around, and not only that, they cluster into these regular arrays, which are quite similar to those arrays that were uh, uh, published in I think 1993 by Matsumoto. Uh, the, the impact of them on his uh, uh, things that we we have actually observed potentially similar things on these Amasa vibrator plates. So, you know, um, all of these things are tying in in, in together. And you have a situation where, okay. It almost doesn't even matter what the medium is either, it seems like. Sorry, but the medium almost is not what's, like, we're fixated on the medium, like, I, 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 go, proceed, I, I don't want to digress here, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, is, is there any other questions? So, so it, it, essentially, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, he was asking uh, about uh, Mazda gas. 
It's a, it's a maser. So actually, you know, before we had, uh, before we got on call too, we got into a conversation. Uh, kind of, what? It's probably the simplest term I think I've ever heard anybody. The simplest way something's put, and that's often like the best way to describe something of kind of your hypothesis of what's going on. And it had to do with like lensing, and you told a story about that. Could you could you go over that again? You remember that story? Well, well, firstly, if you go to, uh, I think even today it might be, or a couple of days ago on on Zero Hedge, there's an article where they've created a incredible powerful laser using a plasma uh, mirror and that uh, I've actually talked about this in this YouTube stream previously right but uh, it's worth because because uh, Slobodan is online right now it's useful to go over it again and and, and essentially um, uh, a plasma mirror um, is able to produce a, a laser intensity and focus that's so intense, they're saying, that they can rip through the fa uh, fabric of space-time. Uh, um, and, and so this is like hot off the press. But, Slobodan, this is what I propose is happening, uh, certainly when we were cutting through, and I said, it looks like a laser. And then when you told me, Slobodan, that you're, you had observed mostly OH groups, you need to go and look at the work of uh, Mondiani. I think he's an Italian guy from the... Uh, uh, 2010 or 2011, 2012. He's doing electrolysis experiments and, and, and plasma onto water uh, experiments. And he finds that his electrolyte gets extremely uh, um, soapy, i.e. it's alkaline, i.e. it's synthesizing more OH groups. He suggests that's because it is producing deuterons from, from uh, electrons and, and uh, 2H. Um, and that may actually be the case. So there's a, a, a lack of protons left to resynthesize pure water. So you end up with a, an excess of OH groups, which might be what's happening. But the interesting thing about OH is, as I said to you previously uh, uh, at the conference, Slobodan, um, that it's one of the most uh, abundant ga interstellar gases and that it self mazes. Now, when I looked at that coin that was exposed to the Amasa gas and it looked like it did a laser cut through it, uh, if you had copper, which is very reflective to light, and you had uh, uh, the plasma mirror at the other end, the gas is coming out. And at some point, there is no ignited gas. So the end of the gas plasma ends just before the nozzle of the Amasa gas jet. So you could have a maser, an OH self mazes. You have an end, which is a plasma mirror, and you have a copper thing. So standing you waves. End, You're creating standing you waves of energy. A, yes. And, and, and it ends up... Uh, unimaginable energy concentration. And if you've also got some nuclear reactions going on because of the 0.2% identified atomic hydrogen that's also supposedly in the Mars gas, uh, you've got that energy coming out in high energy photons. You might have a situation where you have unimaginable energy concentration. And just like it did on the video, it ate a chunk through that coin. At what temperature too? Like that's the even more surprising, like, because well, it, it no, seems it to be- It wasn't at the melting point of copper. That's, a, that's a, and, and from at least from the um, from the thermal imagery, right? You I mean you had what was the top temperature that you guys measured? It was. Uh, I think I, I think the top temperature we measured in the whole day was when we mixed ten when there was uh, we with the one test that we did with ten percent propane and ninety percent Amasa gas, and we put that onto the titanium. Uh, one millimeter sheet and it re registered something like 903 degrees or something it, 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 and but it melted the melted titanium through. no it didn't melt the titanium. okay okay just heated in, in, in the case of the melting titanium we only a achieved on, on the back side of the plate i think 700 and something degrees c but titanium melts at 1700 and something degrees c it's not melting it and we all wrote yeah, well, right on. right right it's not te when, when, technically when, melting. When, when we saw carbon on, on the PTFE, these are experiments you can go and look at the, the, the YouTube video on our channel. But when, when, when we saw the carbon forming on the PTFE and it, it not melting like as quick as it melted through polytetrafluoroethylene that's supposed to go and, and melt or degrade it to 300 degrees C, and it wasn't doing it as fast as titanium was, um, you know, that, that opens some questions. And we saw carbon forming on it. Now, that might be carbon stripping because it's CF, 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 and it's, it's CF, CF2, CF2. It's like a, a polymer of carbon and fluorine. Um, uh, and it might be removing the fluorine in some way and, 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 and taking the, uh, making hydrogen fluoride or whatever and stripping the carbon out. Uh, he, he came up with this, in trying to explain it, he admitted to something that was a test that was done uh, at the, uh, a Japanese university where in 2003 that uh, it was forming nanocarbon all over the titanium, but also it was synthesizing aluminium. And this is really, really interesting because how are you getting aluminium? 
from titanium. Well, yeah. if you do uh, the reaction uh, um, between between those, you, you can have an exchange reaction between 14 nitrogen, which is a boson, so it can easily go in and live in this structure, and 14 nitrogen, which is a bo boson, and that can live in this structure. 14 nitrogen is 78% of the air you breathe. This is being done in air. Right. So you can have a situation where you're, you're, you're on an iron sample, and you've got these exotic vacuum objects and they are fusing the nitrogen in the air and it goes to, I think it goes to hydrogen 1H and 27 AAL, okay? So then both of those are proton, uh, uh, boson, fermions, so they want fermions, to come out. Right. Bear, bear with me on my logic. Right, right, right. <laughs> you've got two bosons easily want to go in, they're 78% of air, right? Iron doesn't want to change. You've got the EVOs coming to the surface of the iron, right? Doesn't want to change. It get, meets the air, the air is then uh, being fused into pro preferentially 1H and, and 27 aluminium. Then you have, that is unbelievably energetic in the many mega electron volts. Right. That causes surface oxidation with the other sort of 20% or whatever it is in the air, in the of, air. Of, of oxygen. You get iron oxide. Then you have extremely hot iron oxide, right next, extremely hot nuclear fresh synthesized monoatomic atoms of aluminium. Right. These two were fused so. together, and they would look like thermite. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. It sounds like thermite to me. <laughs> that's exactly. mm -hmm. And you know what you would end up with? You would end up with hematite spheres and some traces of aluminium oxide. It would look like thermite being used, but it right. would be this technology. I don't even want to go where I'm going there. Yeah, we, we, don't have to go, we don't have to go down that rabbit hole either. I don't want to. I don't want to. Yeah, we won't, we won't go that way. Um, There's your arm. <laughs> so, but, okay, so, but if you could condense it into an iron form, right, uh, the theory or the hypothesis you have, to simplify it to just... I, I, I'd simplify it like this. You, it's essentially, you're creating an active agent. Let's call it a black donut or, or a white donut, it doesn't matter. But even just call it, it's an actor. It's an actor, okay? You have an actor that is able to take m material and uh, uh, it's able to uh, uh, mash up the nucleons and spit them out. With, firstly, it does it all within it. So the energy within it creates thermal energy. The thermal energy can be uh, expelled as synthesized neutrinos. So a, a, okay? mi a micro galactic nuclei in a sense. Well, just, just imagine you've got your, your Dunkin' Donuts donut, but the donut is actually made of electrons, and the electrons attract ions. In fact, they, they even ionize to a certain degree, right. in, in a way, because of they, they have their own kind of like double layers, let's say. Right. But let's not go there. Just say right. that they are able to take ions of material inside them. And when, when they've got the ions of material inside them, uh, 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 they are then trying to pinch that into an extremely small... Uh, it's not a black hole, it's a black ring. <laughs> okay. To, to an observer a long way away, it would look like a black hole because shit was going into it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but up close and personal, and when you look at it on other things, it's like a ring. And, and inside that ring, uh, the things that can occupy the smallest amount of space-time are things that don't uh, are happy playing alongside each other. And it, essentially, it's all energy waves. And, and right. they, they, it's only outside of the device that things become electrostatically physical to us. But inside, they're, they're not electrostatically physical. The electrons have gone, and, and their wave functions are all entangled, as long as they are bosons and they're willing to play nicely with each other. But, uh, you know, inside there, as more material comes in, it can, it can synthesize uh, 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 fermions, okay, so, but they get kicked out. Do you think, it, you do you think so, it's redistributed in another, like a white, the black hole, white hole paradox type of, type of situation at times? I mean, what or do you think? Well, a black, what is a black hole, white hole? <laughs> right. If you had a black donut, which is the same thing, but with, with not in the white hole state. <laughs> Right. In the white donut state. So it depends on if it's it depends on if it's absorbing its surrounding material materials or not. In, you, wouldn't, you would see material going in, right? Right. A, a white hole, you, you could say, is a white donut, but the, the white donut is expelling energy. Right. Because it's sucking material in, but also expelling it. So that's why so it's it so like fascinating to me stuff. for for t uh, teleportation purposes and stuff like that. It's really interesting to think about, you know, uh, talking about faster than light travel. Um, or, and, you know, <laughs> like what what's going on with the space time and stuff like space time trying to alter space time and the uh, 
uh, a Kubla drive or whatever it's called. Um, that's the very principle that they're trying to do is right is like to create Which, that. Whichever path you travel down these various threads, you always end up at Pal Putoff. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah, that's and that's. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's kind of. Uh, it's the entertainment. He's the he's the spokesperson. I guess he's someone who is the, very open to just say. No, no, you know. no, no, no. I worked with George Eagley in 1983. Hal Putoff sent uh, uh, a guy called I think Bernie Hayes or something like that to meet him because he was investigating spoon benders, not spoon benders, yeah. metal bending teenagers right. in Israel. And, and of course, Hal was interested in that time, so sent him. And and then then Dr. Eagley becomes the the first Soviet era scientist to go to I think Brookhaven National Laboratory, the first Soviet era scientist to go into a U.S. nuclear facility. And then and whilst he's staying in whatever accommodation he had, there was some books in the, the in the the, the 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 attic, and one of the books was talking about plasma balls, and he got really interested in ball lightning. And then he oh, did, wow. he, he'd been doing like. 20, he did 20 years or something of studies of anecdotes of, of ball lightning, and this became a a, 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 a a military report. It was a major part of a military report, which has been declassified about, you know, that they wanted to find out, uh, I think, uh, I think it was commissioned in October 2001, and uh, they reported back because they wanted to know anyone in the world that had been doing any research on anything like ball lightning. <laughs> And, of course, he had done this huge body of research, and this was the guy that came with me to test the Amaza gas system. Right. So, you know, but the same guy, I think it was Bernie Hayes, actually went to Canada in the early 80s on the instruction, huh. of, as far as I understand it, Hal Putoff, to visit John Hutchison. That's interesting. And in, in the presentation that, that uh, Kenny Shoulders in 2006 gave to MIT, where one of his pictures is this guy, I think Bernie Hayes, his name, he's still alive today, he still works with uh, Hal, as far as I understand it. He's actually holding one of the classic pieces of John Hutchison's metal up with it broken in the middle. Hmm. It's all <laughs> interlocked. It's very serendipitous. Uh, is it? All right. Well, no, probably not. It's probably there's probably a very good reason for all that. So, I mean, it, uh, the, you know, interesting people attract interesting people. When you're running yes. out of really interesting people, the, the the very interesting people like to meet the very interesting people. And quite frankly, you know, Kenneth Shoulders said in 2010 he has no idea who on earth he can speak to because most of the things that's going on in his head are so far ahead of what anyone else is even capable of comprehending. To find like-minded people that can actually, yeah, absorb kind of like... And it's a yeah. real shame because I think in 2010, Kenneth Shoulders wanted to start distributing kit uh, uh, papers where people could work like a kit description for five dollars or and then he wanted a kit for forty dollars and then he wanted so he already was trying to do what the mfmp was kind of set up to do he he was already proposing that but the internet wasn't really at that level of where where people were kind of engaging these top topics like they are now like like you're enabling now right um and 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 so you know it's it's um so how, how are we doing with it have we got any questions um yeah. no drive yeah no well we're two hours and 30 minutes in this has been quite an experience it's been a lot of information like now my mind's like i'm just reeling i'm like man there's like so many ideas are running through my through my head so uh um, I t- I t- can i say this yeah absolutely in in the 2019 rugby world cup this is an energy drink <laughs> and and this is an energy drink where the water has been synthesized with a Mars vibrator plate. What is that? Yeah. What is that drink? It's an energy drink they're going to sell as an official product for the 2019 Rugby World Cup. Okay, so that's what he produced. He produces all kinds of things. The <laughs> crazy, crazy thing is that Adamenko learned the, the uh, Russian method of cold nuclear transmutation from 1957. That's where he started. Okay? Right? Right. The Japanese, like you, you had uh, all the things that people are talking about now, uh, Matsumoto did in the early 1990s. Roy Shinomaza has been selling face and beauty products and drinking water and systems for purifying water and for growing fish farms and for deactivating radioactive nuclear waste. It's, I mean, he's got to work with the system at play. For 16, 17 years. Yeah. And in the West, 
Oh my god, we're still debating if it's real. <laughs> I mean, where did he come Interesting. for God's sake? People have this meme out there. Oh, I'm very woke. Oh my god, really? Really? Are you woke? Yeah, well, uh, it takes time for people to accept. This, this is technology that humans, in my opinion, were designed to live around. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, if, speaking as far as Star Trek terms, like, okay, so we have our cell phones, we have our tricorders, we have, uh, we have AR and VR coming, so we have the holodecks. Now it's a matter of how do we get our energy, which is a crystal, interesting enough, right? And that's what, that's what metal structure is. And then, and then into the whole, the whole new level um, transmutation is, you know, a replicator, right? And so yeah. to be able to do 3D printing with energetic means like this would be... No, 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 no. You know what I mean? Forget, forget it. <laughs> listen to what Kenneth Shoulders said. Okay. Listen to what Kenneth Shoulders said. All right. With one of these structures, you can put into it a frigging mouse, right? And... And then you split the structure and you re-energize the structure up to the same level. And you break the structure and out of it comes a mouse. And you break this and out of it comes another mouse. And they're exactly the a same. Replicator. Fact, the yeah. same thing. They're just in two locations in space-time. A replicator, teleportation, all these things were science fiction. But if well, we can imagine it, then we, how can we... It, it's more opportunity to create it, right? That's... He's saying teleportation, you would act like, you know, he's implying in that uh, suggestion is you, you're not, you're not necessarily, you can shift from point A to point B, uh, but you can be in point A and point B at the same time and, and you just kill the other one. You make, you copy and paste. Yeah. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah, if so interesting. If you don't turn up at your destination, then they don't delete the original. Right. You can go. You can recover it. You can recover, keep trying. Recover it's, the, it's the like, universal like data. CPIP. If, yeah. if, if 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 the uh, you know the, the 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 verify bit doesn't come back to say you've you've arrived. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what's so exciting. It the original. Exactly. And that's what's so exciting about a lot of this technology that is on the fringe is you're able to explore those ideas and those possibilities. My it's, friend, my friend, how is on the fringe when you've been saying <laughs> Right. Well, because, well, how, how, does he, how is he going to make his... Element. But how is he going to make his income, right? How is he going to be able to operate in the system? He has to do those things, right? He has to sell that stuff. Otherwise, you know, how is he going to make his money? That's, you know, the, you know that's... The, the, the point is, is that... He is transmuting elements. That already is scary to all of modern science, right? Even though 14 nitrogen, 14 carbon and, and, and calcium, sorry, potassium 40 is transmuting in your body every day, it's still scary to a lot of scientists that, that the idea that you can transmute elements. Right. He is changing radioactive uh, uh, decay rate times. He's not the first. Uh, you, you, you've got uh, go and look at the introduction video for Space Earth Human for Alexander Parker Moore's book I list through a selection it's not exhaustive by all means but it's a selection of the people that have observed this phenomena of cold fusion systems uh, changing the radioactive isotope decay right. the real problem for this technology is it, it's not just about making excess heat it changes everything yeah. It's about actually getting a depiction of how to manipulate matter just using energetic checks and like balancing. Look, it's a balancing act. If you thought you had a problem balance. with the energy industry, what would you have a problem? <laughs> how much of a problem when you had an? En uh, how much of a problem would you have when you had the problem with the energy industry, the communications industry, oh, the yeah. transport industry, it the medical a, industry? It would be a <laughs> alt. It would be an extremely disruptive technology for sure, and that's. I think that's a huge resistance to it. It's, it, I don't know of too many other disruptive technologies than one that will influence energy in general and how we look at energy. You know? Shoulders again in 2010 said this. He said, if there's something you wanted to do and you wanted to do it really well, this would probably be the technology that would do it best. Hmm. Something I'm paraphrasing here, uh, but it's very close to what I've just said. You can go and read the transcript. Uh, uh, Basically, there's almost nothing that you would want to do well. He says, I don't care about anti-gravity. Just give me propulsion. Propulsion is much more useful because I can use that in space. Yeah. I don't need something to push against. <laughs> right. 
And propulsion. Uh, well, sorry, pro gravity to go anti gravity against. And all a propulsion is is getting from point A to point B too. You don't have to look at it. It's very simple. Yeah. It's yeah. very simple. You get a lump of ions. You chuck them into an Evo. They lose their mass and inertia. You accelerate it from point A to point B. And at this point, you destroy the Evo. And the atoms have gained that speed. Let's say in a normal cathode ray tube, you could accelerate it up to the speed of the one tenth of the speed of light. When it hits this other thing, it pushes it. And you've literally broken fundamental laws of, of physics. physics and, as, yeah. and, 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 and as Ken would say, uh, man-made laws. Right. All, <laughs> That's... all wrong. Uh, well, on that note, I, I, I really appreciate you coming on. It was a fantastic experience. And down the road, we, we should do it again for sure. And then, um, yeah, I mean, is, is there anything you're working on that you want to tell people about or anything like that? Anything you want to well, check out? Right, I can... right now, so, so I, I talked through my choices for indium. It, it, it was soft, malleable, low met temp, melting point temperature. 87% of it was a beta isotope. We know beta isotopes can change very, very fast. This one has a 30,000 times the life of the universe length. So if we can change it quickly, that would be great. It what about bismuth? Electrons, electron, electrons can feed an Evo. So... Uh, 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 then uh, what happened actually was uh, we wanted to test the before and after material uh, in, in Alan Goldwater's uh, Magic Sound Lab okay. in, in, in California. <clears throat> we had the material that came out of the Amasa vibration system, which looked, I said, don't bother looking at the before material in case, we, in case we've got nothing on the material that started, uh, you, you know, that we've treated rather. But we, there was massive apparent transmutation, and, and in, in particular structures, which, as I say, it's not only transmutation, it's about morphological and, and spatial, where, where those transmutations are occurring. So you, you, with that vibration, uh, sorry, with that system, uh, uh, we said, yes, it looks like it's done it. So let's look at the starting material. So we had already previously cut off some segments uh, of the material that we took to Japan for la later testing. And we put that under, and it just had so, a bit of nitride, a bit of oxides on the surface, as indium does when it's exposed to air for a period of time. Right. So he said, well, you know, let's see if uh, we can clean it to, to cut off any dirt or whatever is on the top layer. And he put it in this 40 US dollar, bought off a, a, a very popular site for buying things off mm -hmm. uh, uh, site, uh, 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 ultrasonic denture cleaner, you know, for cleaning Yeah, dentures ultrasonic. Your, your, yeah, baths, yeah. yeah. I've, I've, I've used no, one. No, nominally claimed to be at 42 kilohertz with about I don't know, some, some ridiculously low 25 or 35 watts input power. Right. He's, he's done the, the sound analysis on it. It looks like it's actually around about 46 kilohertz, but that's on the mm -hmm. threshold of his microphone because it's a 96 kilohertz mic and blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, anyway, so uh, he, he's established that, it, yes, it's around the ballpark of the claimed uh, 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 oscillation frequency. He put it in there. Now, I'm looking at the, I've already looked at the, the one material. I looked at the uh, uh, before material without cleaning. He went away and cleaned it. He came, came back, he exposed it for just ionized water and a bit of my anti cleaning fluid. This has certain elements in it, which we know. He then gave it to me. I put it on the, the SEM table, put it in there. He went off to get a coffee. And I, and I just put it on the SEM and it was just literally mind blowing. There were three massive, two millimeter diameter blast craters hmm. the rest of the surface was nice and clean but in these blast craters there were uh, blended into silicon dioxide from the uh, indium blended into fluorine and when you run the calculations on the calculator these kind of things make sense and you're and this is uh, uh, inspected on the SEM before and after right the actual sample uh, yeah so so it would appear that there was massive transmutation occurring so right now uh, we bought some more indium. Uh, he's putting it under the, with the two and a half inch sodium iodide detector, arranging that. And on Monday, uh, that is tomorrow. Excellent. Californian. So we'll start to run experiments. So if people want to see your your data and all the experiments you have, you have one place to go. What would be the one spot to go? I can link it in the description. So to, to look at our historical work, we have a site called quantumheat.org uh, and there's a donate page on there if you want to find out how you can support our project. It is basically entirely funded by people who are willing to give their own time and resources, people in the community that are willing to analyze our work and offer ways forward and, and the generosity of, of the crowd. 
this means that we can maintain our independence. We can go and visit John Hutchison. We can go and visit Royish and Amaza and not be a threat to them. So we can tell them stuff. We're not under any NDA for doing anything. They can tell us stuff and we can merge minds and, and find an answer to this problem. So any help, massively pre uh, appreciated. And everything that you've heard about today and everything on that site was only enabled by uh, the combination of these factors. So that that's one thing. Now. Th Principally right now, because it's not very responsive, that side, it was parked as a historical document. And we worked through Steemit. Uh, we have a, a, a steemit.com uh, uh, forward slash at MFMP. And we also have a Facebook a Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. It's a bit mouthy, but uh, we wanted the full name of the project in there. And we also have a, 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 um, a Twitter feed. And from those, you'll be able to find uh, the, the most common things that we're doing and, and updates on our work. And, and then our YouTube channel, again, Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. There is a huge body of work there. You can see some of the most recent stuff. And there will be a lot of really, really interesting stuff. The, the stuff that, that from the analysis of this done at Allen's, uh, I said to Alan when I analyzed this, I said, Alan, we cannot even begin to comprehend the significance of this data. Uh, uh, it's literally going to melt people's minds. <laughs> and this is just one small sample from John Hutchison. Mm. It, 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 it's absolutely breathtaking what's gone on in this sample. A small amount of the analysis so far has been shared of this, but uh, really, and, and from this sample and the data that is already in the pipeline to, to go out, uh, you should be able to work out the frequencies that, that will be required to do this in a non-physical way. And we are literally then going to be living in a whole different universe. <laughs> well, that's pretty amazing. I'm excited about it. And I, I have my own stuff I would like to do. And, and it's always a pleasure to learn from you and as well as so many of the people you spoke about. Um, and I, like, again, I, like I said, I'm so grateful for you coming on. I appreciate it so much. It's, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. It's, sometimes it's faster just to talk these things. So people often say, oh, you're like a fire hose. And it's like, yeah. God. You do, you do <laughs> unload some serious amount of information for sure. But you, a lot of times it's bite sized and you can get little bits and pieces. I'll have to go back and look at it. And, you know, maybe I'll cut up some of this and, uh, for promotional use of, of, um, of uh, quantum, quantum heat and stuff like that. So That'd be help, great. help you out. So. Cool. Well, I appreciate it so much. And, Thank you, uh, Dan. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, yeah, it would it be nice if people could ask? Is there any questions still out there? There'll probably be later on comments, and uh, I'll co I'll come back to you, and then I'll I'll hit up uh, I'll hit up um, my social media feeds, and yeah, and we'll so, we'll so try I to. Just, I just want one closing. That, that, that there wasn't uh, particularly some uh, uh, specific things. There were some specific things, but to summarize. You can start by taking two pieces of carbon, three 12 volt batteries and sparking them together. That's one way. You can, you can start by getting yourself a $40 uh, dollar ultrasonic uh, 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 denture cleaner uh, 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 and you can get uh, about $50 worth of uh, indium foil. And uh, if you follow our experiments over the next couple of uh, weeks, then you, you may see that transmutation is possible. We need to verify that, but it does yeah. look like it's pretty strong. And it's following the science. This, this right. came about through reasoned logic. Then the last one is, if you have an HHO generator or you know someone that does, you can do what Stoyan Stank, Stank, uh, Stankovic, uh, sorry, Slobodan, sorry, Slobodan, Slobodan Stankovic did. And he took some carbon and he uh, um, uh, blew his torch on there. And there was apparently massive transmutations, the same kind of transmutations that George Osawa saw in the 1970s and 80s that has been replicated. I would recommend, as I recommend to Slobodan, that rather than scraping off the sample, you actually look at it in situ. So you can see the morphological and the spatial arrangement of the material. We did this with tungsten, and you will see in the next couple of days, or the next couple of weeks, that what happened with the tungsten that was exposed to a Mars gas, and with the indium that was exposed to a Mars gas, is something happened just under the surface, and it caused transmutation, and it blew off the top, or caused a massive ridge. And so these are, that I've given you three different examples. One is at a price point of almost nothing. The next one is <laughs> is kind of like dinner money for a primary school level. And and uh, but the the third one is is within a lot of people's means to do. And uh, between myself, the work of Roshi and Amaza, 
uh, uh, the work of George, Dr. George Eagley and the work of Slobodan uh, uh, um, Stankovic uh, and referring back to the Yule Brown work in 1991 with radiation remediation, we're starting to open the lid on this science. And so thank yeah. you very, very much. And thank you to all the listeners and both right now in the live stream, but in the future for sitting through this. And I, I hope you get something <laughs> that uh, can move this society and this planet forward. Beautifully said, my friend. Well, until next time, guys, thank you for watching and thank you to my guest. And uh, yeah, have a wonderful day and enjoy every present moment to the fullest of your ability.